Hey everyone, my name's Jacob Strickling and I'm going to be your host for this Junior Chemistry Course 2. Now for this course you're going to need the Tiny Science Lab Junior Chemistry Set 1 and the Tiny Science Lab Junior Chemistry Set 2. Um, perhaps though, sometime in the future, Tiny Science Lab has combined a um, both sets into one big junior chemistry set and you might have that one. So well done, future you. <laughs> uh, you'll also need, of course, the workbook um, that has been downloaded and printed. And for some of the lessons, you're going to need a few extra bits and pieces. But that's set out quite clearly um, in the instructions here. So we're going to be looking at chemistry. And chemistry helps us understand the world around us and how, you know, substances interact and produce new substances. It's going to help you think about what you eat and the things that you use and the things that you make things from. I find chemistry super interesting and I'm looking forward to doing a whole heap of chemistry with you. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to be introducing the equipment. So I'm going to go through each piece of equipment. Um, we're going to see um, how to draw it and we're going to discuss how to use it as well. So you'll notice that there's this wiry thing. It's like a metal mesh. Now it's sort of like a metal tripod. It's like a a little stand um, that you'll be able to put a beaker on later on or a conical flask or a little steel thing. Uh, the candle goes under it and then this goes on top. But you need to unfold it first. Now, when you unfold it, just be careful because there's a lot of little pointy uh, metal parts and those little pointy metal parts could pierce your skin and draw a little bit of blood. Now, if that happens, uh, put a little bit of um, antiseptic cream on it and a Band-Aid, um, and I'm sure it should be all right. If it gets infected, of course, go see a doctor. Um, so seek some medical advice. So I'm just unfolding this little, I guess I'll call it the heating tripod, but it's not really a tripod because it's only got two legs. So it will generally sit here like this, and, You'll need um, later on, you'll need later on, you'll need a candle, a tea light candle to go under it. Now you might have different sized tea light candles. And if you do, if you've got like a smaller one, notice that you can actually fold the legs out like that. It's quite malleable, okay? So this is stainless steel mesh and the stainless steel is quite malleable. And so you can move the legs in and out depending on the height of your flame. Very, very good. And when we draw things in science, we just draw a two-dimensional drawing. It doesn't have to be fancy at all. We like to use a ruler and a pencil for our drawings. So purpose is to heat things on. And when you put it back, oh, and it will go black. It will go black and that's okay. And you can wash this in water if you wish. Okay, this won't rust because it's stainless steel. And so you need to fold it back up to put it back in the set and it should go in the set like that. The next component or piece of equipment is the beaker. Now the glass beakers are probably my favorite. These are 10 mil glass beakers and I like glass because you can see through it and also it's easy to clean. You can also heat it up, it will withstand high temperatures. The downside about glass is that it's very brittle. And so if you break, if you drop it onto a hard surface, uh, like some, a tile floor or a concrete floor, it will break, it will break. But that's okay because you can always buy another one from Tiny Science Lab if necessary. So don't have a heart attack <laughs> if you break your um, beaker um, because you can get a new one. You can get a replacement. Again, a two dimensional drawing Imagine I sliced it in, you know, from top to bottom here. You'd actually only draw 
the the walls that you can see. So the top part of it, you don't actually you don't actually put a line, and that actually shows that the top is actually open. And there'll be a line out the bottom, down the bottom, because it's closed down the bottom. Okay, so very good for heating things in, mixing chemicals. Excellent. Then we've got a few goodies here few goodies here, when I take out this plastic container, you'll actually note that there's a white dish, okay, a little plastic white resin dish. It's very good for putting chemicals on. Um, you could put small amounts of liquid on here. You could actually even, you know, put some liquid in a mosquito larva and, you know, um, observe the mosquito larvae. Uh, lots of different uses, but don't heat it up. Okay, that's one use it doesn't have. If you heat it up, it will melt. That's not good. So that's your white plastic dish. And again, when you draw it, you don't draw a three-dimensional picture of it. It's just as if we cut through like that, and you're just going to draw the cross section, and the top is open. Then you've got a lovely little um, container here with a screw top lid. It's made out of plastic. So I'd call it, I'd just call it a plastic container and you can store bugs and critters or little things that you find. You can put them in here. Remember, remember though that some bugs and critters do sting and bite. So be careful if you're out collecting them. Um, and also it's best if you collect them, try not to kill them. You know, maybe observe them for a while and then put them back. Imagine if a giant hand came down and grabbed you by the scruff of the neck and dropped you into a container and then put the lid on and left the lid on and you you know you starved of oxygen and food wouldn't be very nice would it so it's not nice for the bugs either just keep that in mind plastic container don't heat it up because it will melt okay don't heat it up because it will melt then there's a little wooden disc okay a little marketing disc it's made out of timber and uh Hmm. We cut it on our laser machine and you can smell the nice cedar timber and you can smell a little bit of the burnt from the laser. Hmm. I like it. Then there should be two little dishes and one of them is stainless steel. Okay, One of them is stainless steel and the other one is aluminium. Now the stainless steel is stronger than aluminium and so that's one way that you can tell the two apart. The stainless steel is slightly denser than the aluminium, okay? So you've got a stainless steel pan and a aluminium pan. Now the stainless steel pan will resist more heat, okay? It will resist more heat than an aluminium pan. Um, with our candle though, it doesn't produce enough heat to damage either of them. So I wouldn't worry too much about how much heat is produced. Okay, so let me pop him back. In you go. And if you put everything back the way that you found it, it actually makes it better to use later on. Then I've got a small conical flask. So this is a 5 mil conical flask. In junior chemistry set 1, there's a 10 mil conical flask. This is a 5 mil conical flask. It's got a beautiful rubber stopper in it. I really do love rubber stoppers. Rubber stoppers are made from rubber. <laughs> rubber is flexible which is really good because that means you can push it in hard and it forms a good seal. Okay, so that's why it's made out of rubber. It's so that you can produce a good seal. Um, the, the conical flask, it's shaped like a cone, you know, like an ice cream cone. Um, you can heat things in it. You can store things in it. You can store liquids in here. You can do some biological experiments in here. Or you could maybe put a tiny little bit of algae and grow some algae. Or you could get, keep a mosquito larva or even a tiny little bug alive. You could make a tiny little terrarium out of this. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? So that's our, that's our conical flask. Now we've got some tweezers. Okay. Now, when you get your tweezers out, you'll notice that it should have a little plastic ring on it. Now... You can actually make this ring from a piece of straw if you get a straw and you cut the ring. Um, but I always put the ring back in the end where the tweezers go. That way I know where it always is. And tweezers are good for um, removing nasal hair. No, not nasal hairs. It's actually very good for eye. 
No, not eyebrows. Okay, <laughs> they're actually really good for holding hot things. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> almost broke my beaker. So for example, you can actually pick up a hot beaker. You can pick up a hot beaker with your um, tweezers or you could even pick up a hot um, wire gauze. Okay, like this with your tweezers. If you wave it around a little bit, it will cool down quite quickly. Uh, the beaker, so you can move it around like that. Yay! So it's good to get practice in moving things around with your tweezers. Because if you get burnt, it's going to hurt. Um, typically, most of you might experience a small burn um, from touching something hot. But put it under cold water. Put it under cold water. Run it under cold water. Uh, and if it's really painful for a long period of time, then of course, seek further medical help. Now, obviously, I can't give medical advice. So just remember that. That's not real medical advice. That's only suggestions. Okay, They're only suggestions. Seek a professional for help. A medical professional for help. Not me. I'm not a medical profession. But I can give you... I've done a lot of first aid courses. And I've burnt myself quite a lot of times. And I know that um, cold water is very, very helpful. And then we get the glass test tubes. Oh, aren't they nice? Okay, very, very nice. And you can um, heat things in a glass test tube. You can put liquids in them. You can even put solids in them. And if you put a rubber stopper on it, like this, you know, you can store things. And if you get the wooden peg, well, let me try and get the wooden peg out. If you get the wooden peg, you can actually hold your um, test tube with the wooden peg. And I'm going to show you something else that's a little bit tricky, okay? But if you go to Junior Chemistry Set 1, you should have received okay, a um, ice cube tray. Now, you can buy these separately from Tiny Science Lab if you've lost yours. But have a look at this. You can actually put your test tubes in this little ice cube tray. That's a good way of storing your test tubes, isn't it? There's a nice little hint uh, for later on. So test tubes, we can draw, just cut it through, close at the bottom and open up the top. And of course, I've even shown you the um, wooden peg already. Very good for uh, using hot things or picking up hot things. Um, but of course, it will burn if you put it in the flame of a candle. So if it's going to go near a flame, sometimes I dip them in water first to keep them cool. Now I'm going to show you something. Don't do this, but I'm going to break the peg. Okay, pull it apart. Come on, here we go. I'm sure I can pull it apart. Oh no, I've broken the peg, right? No, I have not broken the peg. I need to just put it back together. Now, don't forget that someone put these together in a factory somewhere. It can be done, and it can be done fairly easily. If you can't do it, then get an adult to help you. Hopefully they can do it. Oh, oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Now, help. Help responsible adult. Oh no, I am the responsible adult. Um, so I think, I think I have to push. Hopefully I haven't made it worse. No, I can do it. There we go. I'll pop the spring back into place. That's very good. And then I'm going to, so I'm really showing you that you can actually pull this thing totally apart and put it together and voila. Look at that, that's French for there you go, voila. <laughs> so there we go, you can fix up your peg if need be. And finally in this container is a vial, V-I-A-L, not V-I-L-E, vial, V-I-L-E is like, oh, something terrible, yeah. No, but vial, V-I-A-L, I'm not sure where that word comes from, but it's like a small container, okay? And um, you could put a little necklace up. No, you can't because it's not. But if you had a, a vial of some special liquid that, I don't know, smelt very nice or something like that. But you could put some chemicals in here. Um, you could store things in here, crystals even. Um, yeah, lots of different uses. So that's it for this equipment. And of course, don't forget that there's a beautiful foam infill. And if that foam infill gets dirty, you can actually pull out the foam infill and wash it. Not in the washing machine, of course. <laughs> but just under some warm water, a bit of soapy water, and then just dry it 
in a bit of a shady spot so that you know not we don't need to put it out in the full sun it might like cook it um, but just in a bit of a dry shady spot and it will dry after a few hours okay well hopefully you've had uh, fun learning about the equipment in junior chemistry set two and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next lesson bye for now Hey kids, in this lesson we're going to be learning how to light a match and use it safely. So lighting and using a match safely. So you'll need your chemistry set too and a box of matches, um, a ceramic plate, a ceramic plate, so Ones, that, ones that's made out of like pottery, um, so a ceramic plate, and of course an adult, responsible adult, to supervise you. Now, safety is very important. So we need to make sure that there's nothing around us that's flammable. You know, we can't, shouldn't do, be doing this in our bedrooms. We should be doing it out maybe on a dining room or a kitchen table. Uh, we don't want to have curtains around us. We don't want to have like paper all over the desk or anything like that. Now, if you've got long hair, you should tie it back. You should tie it back. I've actually seen someone's hair on fire and it was not very good at all. Okay? It's really freaky. <laughs> not good. Okay? Not good. Hair is very flammable. Very flammable. It burns quickly and it's hot and it stinks. Whoo! It will burn your skin. So tie your long hair back. Safety glasses, very important too, okay, for this one. So I'm actually going to keep them on the whole lesson. If you get burnt, okay, if you get burnt, the first aid for this sort of thing is to run your burn under cold water. Hopefully you won't get injured. If you follow um, my directions, chances are you'll be all right. So the best, I think the best matches are actually the classic redheads. I think these are actually really good matches. I've always loved matches. These are called safety matches. Now that doesn't mean they're safe, my friends. No, 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 no. One match will burn your house down. That's not very safe, is it? If you use this fire to light a curtain or something like that, just the match will burn your house down. That's not safe, is it? One match will light someone's hair. That's not safe. The reason that they're called safety matches is that in the old days, yeah, <laughs> you could actually take a match and strike it on any object, like a plate or a glass or the side of your boot, and you could light the match really quite easily. A little bit of friction heated it up, causing a chemical reaction, and the match would flare. The safety matches, so they've got some of the chemicals that are necessary for the chemical reaction to occur to actually in the strike plate. I believe it's either red or white phosphorus, probably red phosphorus. So that when you strike the, the, the strike plate, it actually turns that chemical into a little bit of a gas which becomes um, chemically reactive. So you actually need the strike plate on the matches and the chemicals in this match for it to be called a safety match. So I think the best way to light a match is to actually aim your strike plate towards the center of your ceramic dish, okay? And actually strike straight down like this onto the, the, the strike plate. Whoa, I'll try again. Whoa, had a little bit of uh, some fumes coming off. Yay! Once I get it burning, I'm going to hold it sideways, okay? Once I get it burning, I'm going to hold it sideways. I don't want it to get too close to my fingers, so I'll blow it out. Yeah, oh, look at the smoke. Now, if you've got maybe a classroom doing this, you know, a whole class of kids, you might need to worry a little bit about the smoke detector. Now, this is still hot. Look, this match is actually still glowing. So I'm going to put it onto the ceramic plate. How about I light another one? Here we go. 
All right, here we go. And straight down. Yay, once it's burning, then I can hold it sideways. Okay. Hey, it's a beautiful orange flame, and I see some blue there as well. I'm going to blow that out. And don't put this straight into the bin. I've actually seen bins go on fire as well because kids thought that the match was out, but it was actually still glowing. They've set the bins on fire. So what's special about a ceramic plate? Well, it's not flammable, kids. That's the thing. I mean, a wooden table like this is flammable and actually you'll damage it. Um, if it was a plastic plate, plastic plates are very flammable indeed and you could actually possibly um, cause the plastic to start on fire. Now that's bad, I can tell you. That's really bad. Yeah. Why do we strike it straight down? Well, I guess I've seen other people light matches in a few different ways. One, one way they light it is they, they flick it like that. Now, if you flick it like that, I've actually seen bits of match fly off. You're flying. Ooh, like a weapon. Um, I've also seen, to be honest, when I say oh, I've also seen, my preferred technique used to be flicking it towards myself. Um, I, I actually felt like I had, well, <laughs> I almost felt like I had good control. But, you know, flicking it towards yourself? Maybe not so smart. <laughs> so why not strike it straight down towards the ceramic plate? That way, if it breaks off, it's only, to, only going to hit the ceramic plate. So let's try holding the um, match at different orientations. Okay, different orientations. So first I'll get it burning. Now if I hold it sideways, you know, it's a... It's quite a slow burn, isn't it, as it travels along. You can sort of see it travelling along a bit. It's about to go out, so I'm actually going to go, oh, it went out. I'm oh, getting another one going. What about if I keep holding it like this? Then I've seen kids holding it like this, and then they, they get freaked out because they feel the heat, and rightly so, they should feel the heat freaked out because they actually get burnt. If you keep holding it like this, the fire is going to go up like that, isn't it? Did you see how quickly the fire goes up? Okay. Imagine if this was a bushfire at the bottom of the hill. Okay. Look what happens to the bushfire at the bottom of the hill. Look how quickly it goes up the hill. See that? So ugh, if you were building a house on a mountain and the mountain was totally covered in trees, would it be better to build it at the top or at the bottom? Well, I actually think, in terms of bushfires, it might be better to burn it at the bottom, and not burn it, build it at the bottom, because the, the fire would definitely be less intense. Less intense. And if I lit it and held it up there like this, it goes out quite quickly. So the orientation of the match is actually very, very important. And you notice I'm lighting lots of matches. It's because... I like to light lots of matches because it helps me feel comfortable around them, okay? If I'm comfortable around it, I can actually sort of use it a bit safer than one would normally expect. You get used to holding them, you get used to a little bit of heat, you get used to like tilting them at different angles. It's important to be able to have a match burning for quite some time. So it's not that I just love lighting matches, although I do. Um, it's also good to be able to learn how to fully control it. Now, it'd be really good if you could actually look very, very closely at that flame and draw it with um, different coloured pencils. I see a blue glow and I see almost like a colourless and then I see like a yellow. Those colours are very important. Okay, maybe not at your age, but in terms of understanding physics, that's actually quantum physics. It's all to do with electrons in orbits and electrons jumping from one orbit to another. Uh, uh, electrons um, sort of absorbing energy, releasing energy, and releasing small packets of energy called photons. And those photons are light. And the more energetic they are, well, the bluer they are. The, the less energetic they are, the redder they are. So the, 
the the jump that they make is called a quantum jump and we call them quanta these little um, particles of light uh, very very interesting and um, yeah you wouldn't even know it would you that you're doing something so complex just by looking at a flame okay well anyway that's it for this lesson um, hopefully you've learned how to use a match safely light and match safely and that you feel a little bit more comfortable around them okay I'll see you later bye for now hey kids thanks for joining me today in this lesson we're going to be doing more marvelous matches going to do a little demonstration and experiment um, so get ready to have some fun and to learn some interesting things now remember tie any long hair back make sure there's a responsible adult some safety glasses would be a great idea as well you know safety glasses never wreck a good experiment some extras you need well of course you need your junior chemistry set too um, you also need some plasticine so or dough uh, you could probably even use like some cardboard we're going to be poking some matches into something some polystyrene a foam tray hmm I like this one because it smells like pop <coughs> I was gonna say grapes but hmm, not any grapes that I've had lately um, you also need a ruler with centimeters and millimeters a uh, stopwatch now I'm just using a, a mobile phone as a stopwatch some matches of course it's the ceramic plate and a pen to write some um, results down and hopefully you've got a worksheet like so well let's start off with the invisible hair trick the invisible hair trick so you need to get your matches and we're going to get a match burning so remember we aim the strike plate towards the center of the ceramic plate and strike straight down and you'll get your match burning like so now what you really need to do is burn the top of it really really well the top of it has to be burnt really really well so really burning the top of it so that it becomes quite thin okay see how it becomes quite thin at the top that's very important then I'm going to hold my match like this okay hold my match between my two fingers like this then I'm going to extract one of my gray hairs and wrap the hair around the match so here we go I've got the the hair wrapped around the match and then I'm going to count to three and then I'm going to pull the hair and snap the top of the match off are you ready set one two three click oh did you see that see how I broke the match hey I'm going to do that again okay I'm going to do that again so strike down light the match I need to get it burning very very well so this is where we were practicing last lesson holding the match at different angles to get it really burning I need it nice and weak up the top there we go I think that looks good all right so there we go I'm holding it I'm going to pull out it's actually very important how you hold it believe it or not okay pull out my hair around we go three two one go oh, didn't work let's try again oh dear maybe you can see what's happening here hmm okay let's try that one two no <laughs> I'm not wrapping it around my head I've got to wrap it around the match three two one click 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 hey right, just got it in the end now I keep hear me saying click 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 this is how you hold the match now the hair is not actually pulling the match head off it's there's nothing there I mean my hair is only a centimeter long how it could be wrapping it around and hold I don't know it's not very um what's the word <laughs> uh, not impressive oh, I've forgotten the word it's on the tip of my tongue uh, 
Anyway, how do you actually do it? Well, it's this third finger that's important. This third finger here, the middle finger is important because you've got to get your nail, you've got to get your nail, and you've got to put the nail at the base of the match. See how I'm clicking it? See, by clicking, clicking the match, you can flick the head off. There we go, I've actually just flicked the whole top of the match off by this clicking part. So if you time it right and go click like that, click, 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 you can trick some people. Now, this is an example of Newton's first law. And that Newton's first law says that an object at rest will tend to stay at rest, and an object in motion will tend to stay in motion. And so when you click it, it's at rest and you're trying to move the match quite quickly and so the top of it stays where it is and so breaks off. The top of the match is at rest, you're trying to move it very, very quickly and so it sort of breaks off because it has a tendency to stay at rest. All right. Now, have you heard of a chain reaction? Probably not, probably not because you're just a little kid, aren't you? <laughs> so a chain reaction is basically where one thing starts and then it causes other things to um, sort of uh, react and then that causes another thing, one to react and another one. If you've got a big crowd of people and one of them starts screaming and carrying on, then the people around them might start getting all upset and agitated and then the next people and then before you know it, the whole crowd is going crazy. That's, that's called a chain reaction. Also happens in a nuclear reactor, believe it or not, where you have uh, all these uranium atoms and if uh, one is triggered, then it triggers three more next to it and then they trigger three more, so it goes one, three, nine, twenty, I can't count that high, that high. Uh, I can count that high, that high. I can't use the English language very well either, can I? Um, so what I'm doing is I'm flattening out my plasticine like this and I'm going to line up some matches. Okay, now I might actually, I might actually just put a match every centimeter. That's what you need the ruler for. Okay, so you need the ruler. I wonder whether they're going to be close enough. That's not quite one centimeter. Will they be close enough? Hmm, so I'm doing them one centimeter apart. Do you think they're close enough to get a chain reaction? That's the question. Hmm. Will the heat from one light the next one? That's a very good question, isn't it? So I've got five matches and they're each one centimeter apart. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Does it? Five matches and one centimeter apart, but there's four gaps. All right, well. I might, I might actually do this straight away as a bit of an experiment. So I've got five matches, I'll write that down, and the distance between each match is one centimeter. The total distance is four centimeters, and I'm going to time how long it takes for the fire to travel along. That's what I'm going to do. So I need my stopwatch, which is found on the clock section. All right, here we go. Light my match like this. Okay, get it burning. And as soon as that match starts, I'm gonna press start. All right, it started. And will a chain reaction occur? Hmm, what do you think? I don't think so. <laughs> Blow that out. No chain reaction. So I'm going to go dash, dash, no chain reaction, too far, too far apart. All right, so that was actually, that was actually an experiment or part of the experiment. So, interesting. You need to have, I need to have the gap smaller than one centimeter. So, I might try eight millimeters apart. So, 
that's 0 0.8 of a centimetre. Okay, there we go. So the next one is at 1.6 centimetres. Next one's at 2.4. And the next one's at 3.2. There we go. What do you think? And then I'll just line them up with the ruler so that the heads are sort of in line. Do you think we'll get a chain reaction? They're a lot closer this time, aren't they? So again, I'm using five matches. The distance between them is 0 0.8 centimetres. So the total distance is 3.2 centimetres. Let me get my stopwatch happening. Will I get a chain reaction this time? Light the match. Okay, here we go. Just move that a little tiny bit in the middle. Get my stopwatch. This would be good for someone to help restart. Oh, I think it's going to happen. Please. Yes! Will it light all the, the... Will it do this next one? No! So, hmm, dash, dash, comment. The second one took a little bit of time to ignite, but then it ignited the third one very quickly, but then the fourth one didn't ignite. So second took time, quickly ignited the third, but then no further. Isn't this interesting? I find this very, very interesting. How far apart do you think we should put them? Well, that was 0 0.8 centimetres or 0 0.7, 7, 0 0.7 centimetres. So I might do 7 millimetres, 7 millimetres, okay? All right, let's have a go. First one goes on 0. Next one goes on 0 0.7, then 1.4. 2.1 and then 2.8. There we go. So, five matches again, 0 0.7, and that gives me up to 2.8. All right. What do you think, people? Hmm? This is interesting. Face ID. Let's get a match. Re oh, ready, steady. Get ready to press start. And I've started. Yes, yes. I better get ready to press stop. Just think. No. Come on, light the next one. I sort of tilted a little bit of away from it. I mean, I might have to cheat a little tiny bit. No! Same as above. It's not going to happen. One match is actually helping the other match to burn. Well, I can see it bending. Uh, that is not going to happen. Almost exactly the same as above. As above. All right. Make sure they're out so that you don't burn yourself. This is a this is a very interesting experiment. I don't actually think I've sat down and taken the time to do this before. It must be fun being a kid because you've actually got time. Time. That's one good thing that you guys have got. You guys have got some time. I'm an old guy. I don't have much time left. <laughs> okay. So, um... That was 0 0.7 apart. How about I go 0 0.6 apart? Now I'm hoping that you're doing this yourselves. Okay, this is not, science is not something that you should just watch other people doing it. 
Okay, science is something that you should be doing yourself, particularly experiments. Now we want to make we want to make sure that the matches are pretty similar to each other. So six mil. Okay, if you get some that the the heads are really quite small, that's not a very fair experiment, is it? This one should be at one point two. 1.8 and 2.4 trying to make sure that they're equidistance apart at the top there the bases are the same okay there we go all right I think this will be exciting are you excited okay here we go. And ready. Light the match. Get ready to press start. Start. Three, four, five, stop. 4.5 seconds. And now I've got a little bit of a bonfire. 4.5 seconds. Yeah, I got a chain reaction. Chain reaction, uh, five matches, 0 0.6. Um, so what distance was that again? Um, that was 2.4 centimeters. The time to travel was 4.5 seconds. The average speed is the distance divided by the time. So now I go to my calculator and the distance was 2.4 divided by the time 4.5 and that is half a centimetre, 0.5 centimetres per second. Um, 4.5 centimetres per second. So a metre is 100 centimetres long. So that would actually mean, if it was travelling at half a it would take 200 seconds to travel a metre. There we go, 200 seconds. Three minutes. I bet it wouldn't take that long. I bet I bet once it got going and the flares were going, I bet it would go a bit quicker. Now, so I'm going to put, um, went quite quick. Um, once it started, went quite quick. Once it started, once started, the, um, the, the, the heat caused the others to light quite quickly. Um, flames travel quickly. Very interesting. So you do have to have a minimum distance um, or a maximum distance. You can keep going with this, put them even closer. Now, some people might say, Jacob, that is not a true chain reaction. That's not a true chain reaction. A chain reaction, they might say, is where you start with one, all right? I'm just flattening, flattening this out. Where you start with one, I think I'm gonna be using a lot of matches here. And so I'll go here, and then we'll go to two, see? And I've got to put them within six mil of each other. See, from that little experiment, I now know that they have to be within 0 0.6 of a centimeter distance apart for them to actually ignite. So I'm going one to three, and then I'm going three, to five, something like that. So I'm sort of doing like a triangle or pyra pyramidical, pyramidical, pyramidical. There's no such word as pyramidical. <laughs> and I'm going to film this. Now, if you do this, probably best to do it outside, as long as it's not total fire ban, of course and definitely away from anything flammable because um, it's really going to flare up. Okay, it's really going to flare up. I think, I've never done this before. Actually, I have. You actually, by doing something like this, you actually get a bit of a feel for how bushfires travel and about the danger of them. So it gives you a greater appreciation. That's right, sometimes when you're playing it helps you understand life a little bit more. Now I'm going to I'm going to film this because I'm sure we're going to. Want, I might even. What do you think? Should I put it in slow motion? 
Yeah. I'm going to go slow motion. Woohoo. Here we go. Light my match. Oh. There we go. I've got my match lit. Press the slow motion button. Ooh la la. I don't know what that will look like. I told you this was dangerous. Ooh la la. I told you this was dangerous. Look, woo! Stay away from that. Wow, look at that. It's like a, it's like a bonfire. All those matches working together. Wow, the sum of them is far more impressive than the individual, isn't it? That's a, there's a lot of life lessons there, that's for sure. You might have heard of the people called the Amish in America and Pennsylvania, I think, and they get together and build giant sheds, all working together as one almost. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> so, all right, well, um, lots of things that we could think about there. Is this a, what sort of change do you think this is? Do you think this is like a reversible change or what we call an irreversible change? Do you think we can go from these matches back to like, you know, these burnt matches back to like a, a normal match like this? No, no, that'd be very, very difficult. So it's not a reversible change. It's an irreversible change. Irreversible, you can't actually go back. Hmm, there we go. Well, a marvelous matches. Uh, make sure you stay safe. Always do this with a parent. Make sure that there's nothing flammable around. Okay, hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Hey everybody, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the unlit candle. Now, I love candles, and candles come in many shapes and many sizes. Uh, this is a fairly um, high tea light candle. Now, I'm not 100% sure why they're called tea light candles, but that's what they're called. This one here, its height is not, it's about half the height. It's a lot thinner, isn't it? Um, very similar, the same, the same diameter, just half the height. So probably half the volume as well. Now this candle, it's a, hmm, it's a nice smelling one. It's sort of like a, I don't know, it's like a domey, a domey type of candle. This one here, whoa, it's a big thick cylinder. Look at that, big thick, very heavy. Oh, about half a kilo or something like that. Um, and this one is your classic emergency candle. And I quite like it because it's fairly uh, symmetrical. It's got a little bit of a taper, but not too much. And typically you'll buy these in packs of eight or something like that. And they're, sometimes people use them in power blackouts. They put them around the house. But I've seen lots of news stories um, on the TV where candles have actually been responsible for burning down houses. And probably one of the reasons is, is that they can get knocked over fairly easily. And then when they're, they're knocked over like that, uh, they could maybe ignite the curtains or something like that. Now, in 1848, um, Michael Faraday who was an English scientist, did a, a series of lectures on candles. Now, back in the old days, before they had television and that sort of thing, um, one of the forms of entertainment uh, was when scientists actually went to, like, uh, big halls and they did lectures on science. And that was sort of the entertainment of the day. So... People could go to plays and to music, but also to science lectures as well. How awesome would that be? Oh, bring on the old days, that's for sure. Now, 
One of the things that Michael Faraday is famous for, well, he's actually most famous for his discovery, not, his, not discovery, but explanation of the relationship between electricity and magnetism. Um, he actually was able to visualize the, the relationship between what was going on with changing electrical fields and the magnetic fields that were produced. <clears throat> and basically, because of his work, we have our useful electricity today. Uh, it's interesting, though, that, you know, he just didn't limit himself to one aspect of science, just like Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, was interested in many aspects of science and mathematics. Same thing for Michael Faraday. In fact, many great scientists didn't just limit themselves to one particular field. Uh, anyway, so that's something interesting to know. But in this lesson, we're going to make observations. Observations. Now, observations, we've got five senses. Five senses. We've got sight, a very important sense. Uh, in fact, all our senses are very important. Uh, if you don't have sight, then you're blind. If you don't have sight, then you're blind. Another sense is hearing. Now, you might notice that my voice is a little bit strange. And the reason, well, I've got a strange voice, I know that. But, uh, you know, it's extra strange at the moment because just outside, it's cicada season in Australia. It's December, and those, are, those cicadas are blaring. And I've had to do some adjustments with the background audio to try and remove some of that sound. I'm in a fairly good sealed and sound insulated studio, but they're noisy. And I've tried to cut out the noise, but that's made my sound a bit funny. Come and have a look. Or oh, I should say, come and have a listen. If you don't have hearing, then you're deaf. Now, what do you think would be worse, to lose your sight or to lose your hearing? Now, many people would say to lose your sight, but I've actually heard some people say it's actually worse to lose your hearing because if you lose your hearing, you lose the capacity to communicate with the wider population of people. You can still communicate uh, of course, if you're if you're deaf, uh, many communicate with Auslan, the um, the hand things, and that's growing. Uh, that that that's there's a lot more people who are learning to do sign language, which is fan absolutely fantastic. Um, but if you lose your sight, you can still hear, and so you can still talk and communicate with everybody, not just some people. So anyway, um, what else do we have? Touch. You can feel things, okay? You can feel things with uh, your fingers, have got uh, very good um, touch receptors. And if you're blind, a man named uh, Braille developed a special series of like raised dots that you could actually feel and you could actually read by feeling Braille. And when I've ever, I, I don't know if you've ever seen Braille or if you've touched it, I've got no idea how they can use those little dots, to how they can actually feel. But obviously they do. Obviously they do. They do something like this. I'm not too sure. It'd be something very interesting to learn, to learn how to read Braille. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, we got smell. Okay. Now, in science, we don't, we don't use our sense of smell a lot, a lot. Uh, mainly because if there's bad chemicals or something like that, uh, you could you know, damage your nasal passage. So whenever we smell things in science, we usually waft, waft a small amount towards our noses just in case it is a powerful smell. And then, of course, taste. Now, we don't, again, we don't use a lot of taste in science because mainly we are a bit concerned about the chemicals and that sort of stuff. So we've got five senses. And the challenge for this lesson is to come up with 18 observations about an unlit candle. Now, we can do things like, you know, the, the, the length, the, the width, the, the diameter, the color, the smell, the feel, 
um, sort of things that we use our senses to find. Now there's qualitative things. So for example, um, it's white uh, or it smells plain or it's greasy. And then there's quantitative um, there's quantitative observations. And for a quantitative, the word that means quantity, then you're going to need like a ruler or you need to weigh it or you need to like find the temperature of it. Okay, so if there's numbers involved, then it's quantitative. If there's no numbers involved, it's probably going to be qualitative. Now, I don't want to just sit here and do the 18 observations for you. You should do them yourself. You should do them yourself. So you should probably stop the video, pause the video, pause this lesson, do the 18 observations, if you can get that many. I don't even know if we can. And then have a look at the ones that I do. All right, so pause the video and do 18 observations right now. Pause it. Did you pause it? I hope you paused it. <laughs> okay. Hey, here we are. How did you go? Did you get 18? Some of you are like, oh, that was so easy, Jacob. Or no, how can you possibly get for 18? I don't know. Okay, all right. Well, here goes. Let's have a go. I'm going to say that the candle wax is white. The candle wax is white. Now, as I put my finger on it, I'm actually going to, oh, I can actually scrape some of it off with my fingernail. So, the candle wax is soft. The candle wax is soft, able to be scraped off with a fingernail. Then I rub it in between my fingers. It feels slippery. The candle wax is greasy. The candle wax is greasy, feels slippery. How does it smell? Hmm, the, this candle smells a bit like a, a subtle perfume, a subtle sweet smelling perfume. Now, as I said earlier, it's not great to taste things in science, but you know what? I think it's okay to taste this, I think so, a little bit. Okay. Mm, tastes tiny bit perfumey. Mm. Not recommended. Not recommended. <laughs> um, oh, it's got a white wick. Okay, it's got a white wick as well. Okay, that's that part sticking out here. That's the white wick. And the white wick is actually, um, it's got, it's like, it's rigid, okay? It's the, the, the wick is rigid and it's not like floppy. So there we go. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, I can actually pull it out. There's a, do we talk about the metal container? Is that is that the candle? Because I could come up with a few observations there, couldn't I? Ah, uh, better not, better not. That would be cheating. Okay, so I might, oh, the wick just fell out. That's interesting. Okay. So this wick is obviously added last. Um, interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. Uh, let's take some measurements. Now I could use the ruler, but I've actually got a more interesting piece of, um, piece of equipment. It's called a vernier calipers. Okay, vernier calipers. I use these all the time. Um, very, very helpful, these little pieces of equipment, because you can slide slide it like this. Now, you probably can't see the, the measurement on it. Um, actually, maybe. I think you can, actually. So I'm measuring the diameter. I'm measuring the diameter of that candle, and the diameter of the candle is 37 millimetres, and the height, of this cylinder is 21 millimeters, 21 millimeters. And the length of the wick, the length of the wick is 10 millimeters. Now I wonder if I can actually measure the diameter of the wick. I think I can. I don't want to squeeze it too hard because that will change the, well, that will change the, um, 
I squeezed it, but it's actually about 1.8 millimeters wide. Yeah. Mm, how are we going? How many um, observations are we up to? I'm guessing about 10. Where do I get the other eight from? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I could say that the I've just observed that this particular wick actually isn't really part of the candle. It's actually added out later. And it's actually got a little metal base on it as well. So this wick uh, pulls in and out. Whereas on a candle like this, that wick is actually embedded in the, in the candle. Ah, oh, I could talk about the weight, right? I could actually weigh this. Now, I don't have any scales here at the moment, um, but I could weigh it and give you a quantitative, uh, which is probably about 10 grams. Or we could say qualitatively that it's not very heavy. It's actually quite light, okay? This would, I'm sure this would float in water. This is less dense than water, that's for sure. Um, okay, I said it was white. But I can also see that it's slightly reflective. Okay, see how see how I can sort of reflect light off it? So the Yeah, it's shiny. It's shiny. That's another name for reflective. The fact that the something that's shiny reflects light. This is reflecting light. Okay, so it's actually shiny, it's reflecting light. This top edge, it's actually quite sharp. Okay, the top edge is sharp, it's not rounded. Okay, it's not rounded. See this candle here, it's quite rounded. Um, I'm pretty sure I've said that it's smooth or it feels slippery, doesn't it? Um, whoa. I don't know, I'm running out of observations here. Um, it, it is firm, right? It actually, it's not soft like a sponge. Okay, it's not soft like a sponge. It's actually quite firm, so that's, from touch, I can get that. Anyway, they're my observations. Um, I'm not even sure how many I've written down. Um, anyway, but I'll probably write some more down and I'll be in the answer sheet. Anyway, um, how did you go? Did you get more than me? Who knows? All right, well, thanks for um, doing this lesson on the unlit candle with me, and I look forward to seeing you very soon with the next one. Bye for now. Hey everybody, welcome to another lesson. Um, we are looking at the lit candle this time and we're going to attempt to make 20 observations. Uh, I don't, I don't, we'll see how we go. Now, observations include our five senses, um, uh, sight, hearing, touch, uh, taste and smell. And we're going to be doing qualitative observations, things like shape, um, color, odor, and we're going to do some quantitative ones as well to do with the burning. Um, so that might be lengths, uh, widths. We can't do temperature, but anyway, if I had a, hmm, yeah, okay, we're not gonna do temperature. All right, so we're gonna be using matches, so you need adult supervision. Make sure that there's no flammables around. Make sure you tie your hair back. Okay, tie your hair back if you've got long hair. Uh, good idea uh, to wear safety glasses. Safety glasses never um, erect a good experiment. And without further ado, let's light the candle. Now, I always like just to check to make sure that the wick is standing upwards like so. And we aim our strike plate towards the middle of the ceramic plate because the ceramic is not flammable and strike straight down, get the match burning a little bit and then bring it over to the candle. So there we go. All right, let's start making some observations. First thing I see is that it starts off that the um, flame starts off as quite small, okay, starts off as quite small, that there's an orange 
part of the, the top part of the flame is orange and the bottom part of the flame is blue. There's actually a, a orange glow. There's an orange glow at the top of the wick. The wick has gone black. Okay, the wick has gone black. I can see that. I can also see that at the base of the wick, um, the base of the wick is white. And at the base of the wick, the wax is actually melting. Okay, it's turning into a liquid. And it's a circular, it's a circular pool. Okay, it's a circular pool. Wow, that's already quite a lot of observations, isn't it? <laughs> so, very, very good. Okay, now the shape. The shape of the um, flame, how would I describe it? Um, conical? Like, it's conical up the top, like, goes to a cone, see that, goes to a cone, but it also tapers down towards the bottom. Now, what I'm finding very interesting, and I've never actually noticed this before, is that there's a distinct line with the colours. There's a blue down below and an orange up the top. Now, I know, I know from my previous learning that the colour blue is actually a hotter colour than orange. Yeah, if that flame is blue down the bottom, that's actually, that temperature of that flame down there is actually hotter. Now, we can't write that down as an observation. All we can write down is that it's blue and orange. I'm actually inferring from my knowledge that the, the blue is hotter. Um... There is a bit of a dark, a dark section. Oh, there's a dark section in the center, but there's a brighter, there's an, a brighter inner orange. There's a brighter inner orange cone. Yes, it's more intense. I'm loving, I'm loving this. <laughs> this, you know, it's not often that you just get to slow down, you know? Is it? You know, you just, just to slow down and actually study something without the pressures of life pushing on you and just to actually look at something and observe. The center is getting bigger or the pool of wax is getting deeper. Okay, the pool of wax is getting deeper. Now I know, I think Michael Faraday, I think, I think he's famous for making 100 observations. 100. I've only asked us to write down 20 observations. But apparently Michael Faraday made 100 separate observations regarding a burning candle. I'm starting to work out how he did it. Just by, just by looking. I haven't even like used any of my other senses yet. Okay, maybe I should use touch. Ooh, not so smart. Okay, so touch, I'm going to come in slowly. Wow. Wow, ow! It's, the, the heat is very intense. Wow. The heat is very intense directly above the flame. Excuse me. So if I hold my hand here, I can't feel anything. If I hold my hand here, I can't feel anything. But the mo oh, the moment now, if you burn yourself, cold water. If you burn yourself, cold water. It's almost, it's almost as if the heat goes chunk straight up. It doesn't like, it doesn't seem. No heat. No, I can't feel any heat. Now I'm starting to feel it. Wow, the heat. It, it goes, it almost shoots up vertically. I've never realised that. I've always thought that it, it sort of like spread out, that the heat spread out like that. But no, it seems to be shoom, shooting up straight like that. That is interesting. How high above, I can actually feel the heat. That's about 30 centimetres. That's a, I can actually say, 
can feel the heat about 30 centimetres above the, the candle. Yeah, that's intense now. What about from the side? I'm going to use the back of my fingers here because they're more, I think they're more sensitive. I can, I can feel some heat from around the side. I can feel the heat from around the side, but it's not very intense. So some heat from around the side. But most of the heat is going straight up. Now, what about an odour? Is there an odour? Mm. Well, it, there is a fragrance, a fragrance smell. Yep. Now, I'm not going to taste it. I'm not going to taste it. All right, I'm not going to taste the flame. I know you probably want me to, but I'm not going to. Um, I would say also that the there's a dip, there's a dip forming in the um, in that pool. It's like something's being used up. Something's being used up. Something's disappearing. The wax is dip, disappearing. Here's a negative observation. The wick is not burning. Like the wick is not disappearing. The wick is not getting shorter. That's very interesting and very, very helpful. And there is an orange glowing tip of that wick. How high is that flame? The total length of the flame. Is about. Oh, well. Say that the orange part is about eight millimeters long, and the blue section is about five millimeters. So what's that? Five plus eight. Oh, I can't remember what I said. The blue section is five millimeters. Wow. How are you going? How many observations do you have? I might just take off these glasses, just to have a little closer look. I've heard, I remember I've done this a long time ago and I've actually seen little tiny things, little black things go in and then out, in and out. I can't see it this time. I can't see it this time. It's a, it seems to be a very pure wax. There's no like little bits and pieces in there. Okay, well, I am, I'm going to watch the video and I'm going to write down all my observations and I'll see how many I've got. Um, I wonder how many you got. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson on the lit candle. I certainly have. Uh, probably the most staggering thing I found was there's two very the two most interesting things were the blue and then the orange. I never realised, and I know that blue. That must mean it's getting oxygen. Where it's blue. We're getting what we call complete combustion. And the orange, that's incomplete combustion. Well, I'm sure we'll be looking at that in a later lesson. But also the fact that the heat goes up like chunk in a straight line. It doesn't seem to spread out. Anyway, that's it for this lesson. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Ooh, smoky. Hey kids, in this lesson we're going to be looking at candles. Again, candles are amazing. So you're going to need some matches, a tea light candle, a little ceramic plate, a bowl of water, which I'll put to the side because we don't need it just yet, and a fairly large glass vase. Vase? Vase. I don't know. <laughs> Tall tall though, okay? So, all right, I'm going to pop my safety glasses on and we're going to have a little look at what we call reversible and irreversible change. So let me light my match straight down like so. And then I'll light the candle. And this candle's been lit before, the, it's not a brand new candle, but the um, wick was black to start with and it uh, started burning quite quickly. And if we have a little look, it takes a little bit of time, but a tiny little pool 
every time I talk, I sort of like blow out the candle almost. The flame's like, hoo, hoo. so I might try and talk that way. Um, every time I, or if we wait a little bit, and while I was talking a moment ago, I can actually see that the, at the base of the candle, there's a little pool of wax forming. It's like a liquid, okay? The, the solid wax is melting and turning into a liquid. Now, interestingly, the candle wax itself is opaque. Opaque. Now, what that means, the word opaque means it doesn't let light through it. So, actually, it does let some light through it. So, it's actually translucent, okay? So, the, the wax is translucent. It lets only lets some light through. But I'm pretty sure that that molten wax is transparent. I think molten wax lets a whole lot more light through than opaque wax. That is just so interesting. The liquid actually lets light through, but the solid blocks a lot of the light. Why is that? I don't know. It would be a complex atomic thing, that's for sure. Very interesting. Um, anyway, the wax melting, is that a reversible or an irreversible change? Reversible means you can go back to how you started. Can you go back to how you started? Well, if you blow out the candle and the heat is removed, then slowly that liquid goes back to being a solid, translucent wax. So is it reversible? Yes, it is. Melting wax is reversible. There we go. All right, now we're going to do something called a jumping flame. Jumping flame, and this is fascinating, but it also tells us a little bit about how a candle burns. So let me light the candle. I'm actually going to keep this match burning. I'm going to blow out the candle. And then I'm going to bring the... Oh! <gasps> Did you see that? Did you see that? I should get my um, camera to do a slow-mo. I think I'm going to do that. I need a slow-mo of that. Back in a moment. Okay. So, let's pop this on slow-mo. Action. To light the match first. Like that. Didn't jump down. Okay, got that a few times actually. This will be interesting. Let's go have a little look at the slow-mo now. All right. Well, that was pretty awesome, wasn't it, hey? <laughs> so good. Okay. What does that actually tell us? What does that tell us? The flame jumped down. I mean, that's not magic. The flame was actually following a flammable path. The smoke, the smoke itself contains something that's flammable. That's the thing. The smoke, there's something in that smoke that's containing something flammable. Let's just keep that in mind for the future. Okay. All right, anyway, gasping, gasping candle. <gasps> okay, all right, so we're going to need a vase and it needs to be a fairly tall vase and the reason is, don't forget from our previous observations that the heat goes shunk, straight up. And glass, if you heat it directly, uh, can expand and there, it, that can cause it to break. We don't, want to, we don't want to break your favourite vase or vase, whatever you want to call it. I'm also just going to put some water, okay, I'm putting some water around this rim 
so that it forms a bit of a seal on this table. I think it forms a bit of a seal. I might even add a bit of water to the table as well. Okay, so I'm going to add a bit of water to the table as a bit of a seal to stop anything from going in or out. Okay, so here we go. Let's light the candle. And what's your prediction? What's your prediction for how long or for what will happen? Okay, so we've got a good seal. I'm seeing some bubbles happening down here. Bubble, 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 bubble. I'm getting a little bit of fogginess. Okay, and usually fogginess indicates water. Okay, the presence of water. The candle seems to be burning quite normally. Oh, nah, it's just gone out. It's just gone out. It ran out of, well, we're going, we observe that the candle goes out. We observe that the candle goes out. The explanation relies on some of our past knowledge. Do you have any idea? Are you saying something like it's used up the air? Well, I'm telling you, it's used up part of the air, and the part of the air that's used up is actually oxygen. Okay? It's actually oxygen. So the candle requires oxygen to burn. It's interesting. Remember how it went sort of um, misty? That actually shows us that the candle is probably producing water vapour when it burns. Yeah. Hmm. So let's keep all those sort of things in mind. Have you ever heard about something called a terrarium? Okay, a terrarium. Imagine if you've got a nice glass jar and you put some soil in it. Um, maybe you put an ant or a slater in it. And then you put planted a like a, a plant in here, yes, like this. So this would go in here. And then you put a bit of water in here. Then you put it out in the sun. Then, you know, the plant would photosynthesize. The plant would create oxygen. And the, the bug, the ant, would use the oxygen to survive. Uh, the ant produces some carbon dioxide. The plant needs some carbon dioxide and the water. The water can't escape because you've got a lid on here. And you have like what's called a closed system. Now, our whole world, our Earth, is a little bit like a closed system. You know, really only sunlight comes in. And gravity, gravity actually holds everything in. Our, our gases don't leave out into the universe, you know. Um... Whatever we create stays on the planet, which is something to bear in mind. Okay? Bear that in mind that we actually live, I guess, in a giant um, closed terrarium. And so what we do on this world, we have to live with. Or our kids have to live with. Our grandchildren, our, our, um, our descendants have to live with whatever we produce. So that makes... Uh, yeah, that puts a fair bit of ownership and onus on us to, to do our best to look after this fantastic uh, world that we've been provided with. And one of the questions I've got is if this plant is producing oxygen, how big, how big would the closed terrarium need to be? How many plants would I need to actually fully sustain this candle? That's a good question, isn't it? How long would it need to be to fully sustain this candle? I think it would need to be bigger than that. As big as this room out in the sun? I think that should easily do it. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, be very interesting to investigate. Maybe, how could you do it? You could try it in an aquarium a glass aquarium, instead of having water in it, turn the glass aquarium into a, a, closed, um, a closed terrarium with a lid and a seal on it and start with a small one with quite a few plants and put the, put the candle in there. Now, that would be an interesting thing to do as a home project, you know, that, or a school project. I would love that. Oh, that would be very interesting. There's my challenge to you, people. If you're a homeschooler or a home educator, why don't you make a fish tank terrarium? Or if you're a junior school, primary school, why don't you make one in the class? 
and see, see whether you can get one big enough to sustain a burning candle. Wow, there we go. Good challenge. Okay, the next one's called floating candle. Floating candle and you need a bowl of water. You need a bowl of water. Now, I'm pretty sure it won't work with these ones, with these candles. Maybe it will. Will that candle float? Yeah, actually, maybe it will work with it. What would I know? <laughs> so we have a candle floating. Let me show you. And I'm going to, I'm going to light this candle. Okay. What will happen? What will happen? Let's have a little look. I'll just quickly film this and we can have a closer look. Uh, we don't want to film it on slow-mo. What will happen if we leave this like for a long time? Well, I'm going to leave this for a long time. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave this for a long time. Will the candle just totally disappear? This is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I really like science. You know, like, you can make a bit of a prediction. Think about, hmm, the outside's cold because of the water. Therefore, there's no way in the world that the outside can melt because it's going to stay cold. But the inside can melt, and the inside is getting used up. So somehow it's going to get hollowed out. Am I going to, going to end up with a hollow candle? What do you think? Well, try it. Get a candle floated in here. I might even try with another candle as well. Why not? That candle will float too. This one does. There we go. A different candle as well. Yeah. And I'm going to light my candle. Oh, I'm going to try and reuse a match. I'll light this match using that candle. Come over here and see if I can light this. Come on, it's a little bit difficult to light. If you don't have much wick there, candles can be a little bit difficult. It's a very, very tiny blue flame. It needs a little bit of help. Come on, I'll give it a bit more help. Here we go. I'll give you some more help there. I wonder if I actually put the match into the... Oop. Oh, 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 wow. Notice how well that, that candle lit when it actually, that, that match lit when it actually had some wax on it. I'm just trying to relight this candle. Come on. Maybe I need to do it like this. Hey! I got it. Now, while I was doing that, I was actually remembered something else that I loved doing as a little kid. Actually, I loved doing it as a big kid as well. And that is getting a another candle, like this, and actually dripping, dripping hot wax into a bowl of water. I really enjoyed doing that. Drip. This is a reversible change. Drip. That candle's not burning too well yet. In fact, I might have just put it out. Why won't you burn very well, young candle? Not happy with that. And look, when you hold it like in this orientation, the, the drops drop out really, really quickly. I like to build like continents. I like to try and join those drops of wax together. And as they cool down, they cool down quickly in the water, they re-solidify. Okay, they re-solidify. And because it's a reversible change. And I'm building a continent floating island in the bowl of water. I like it. Like that. Dit, 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 dit. See how big you can get it. And 
It's almost like drops of fire are burning. Drops of fire are burning. Anyway. Okay, I'm going to blow that out. And then the interesting thing, the really interesting thing is, when you pull it out of the water, you can actually see like some of the, the drops that have frozen in time on the bottom of the island. Love it. Now, I haven't done it in this course either, but if you get some newspaper and you drip wax on the newspaper, and then when it cooled down, if you pull the wax off, it actually pulls off the ink and you can actually read the newspaper on the, um, on the bottom of the wax as well. Okay, well, I'm going to leave this go for some time and we'll have a look at it in a future video. Okay, bye for now. Hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, welcome to this lesson. Um, we are going to continue looking and seeing why candles are fascinating. Now, have you ever eaten a candle before? Hmm, probably not. Well, I have, and I'm going to show you how to make your own edible candle. So, you're going to need a apple corer, okay, an apple corer. You'll need an apple. I guess the bigger the better. This one's a little bit small, but you know, I'm just using what we had. Sharp knife, um, and so you might want a breadboard as well. I'm just going to cut on this table, that will be all right. Um, so some adult supervision would be helpful. And some almonds. Now, some people say almonds. I might say, I don't know how I say it, almonds. Anyway, don't laugh at me, please. And. These ones are actually flaked almonds. My wife makes a beautiful, um, it's called botekoek, which is a Dutch recipe. Uh, and it's like a shortbread with um, flaked almonds on top. Mmm, delicious. Anyway, uh, that's what we're going to need. So, first thing, I'm going to make like the, um, the body of the candle. And so, I'm going to get my apple core and I don't want to go through like the core of the apple. I mean, that's what these are usually designed for. I'm going to go next to it. Okay, I'm going to go next to it like this. So I'm going down next, next to, because I don't actually want the core. I just want to get a nice good piece of apple. So here we go, all the way through. Now that's going to pop out. So make sure that your, your hand is not on that side. And if I pull it through, can I pull it through? No, I can't pull it through, so it yeah, oh, might go this way. Yay, there we go. There we go. I've got a nice um, bit of apple there. That's not too bad at all. I'm going to cut the, the, the skin off that side. And the skin off that side. Yay! Looks, looks a little bit like a candle, doesn't it? No, just a little bit. Um, it's a little bit wonky. <laughs> But you can get wonky candles, can't you? Okay. So now I need the wick. So I'm going to open up my flaked almonds. And almond is a nut, of course. Hmm. There we go. I'll tear the top off. Ooh, ooh, I better not damage this too much, otherwise my wife will not be happy with me. And I might just tip some out. Okay. I've tipped some out, that way I can choose which one I like the most. Quite like that one. It's quite large. See, it's quite large. It's probably a little bit too large. So maybe I'll go that one. That one's a little bit better. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is just cut a little bit of a notch in the top of the candle so that I can slide the, there we go. Now, you might say, Jacob, that does not look like much of a candle at all, but just you wait a moment. Just you wait a moment. I'm going to get my... Oh, I like this how... Oh, let me put a safety goggle on. Be Safety goggles never wrecked a good experiment. And strike that down. And let's have a look at this. Will that alum... Aluminium. Will that almond light? Have a look. 
Almonds contain a lot of oil. Ta-da! Yay! Look at this, everybody! That looks pretty good, don't you think? You gotta admit, that looks like a candle. Yeah? Oh, yeah! <laughs> so you show this to your friends. Yeah, you say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna eat a candle. Yep. That's amazing, isn't it? Blow it out. Now, this is important. Make sure that you pull out the wick because that will be quite hot. And then, mmm, oh, I love candles. Mmm, they're my favorite food. Mmm, mmm, delicious. I love that. But now you know why I like science so much. Now, you might say, Jacob, why is that science? Well, What's the similarity and difference between that and a real candle? Well, a real candle, the fuel actually comes from the wax. The apple core didn't provide any fuel, it just supported the wick. In fact, all the fuel is actually in the wick, and in this case, the wick does burn up. It contains oils, and those oils are very flammable. There's a lot of energy in a nut. So a lot of energy in oils and sugars, um, just to let you know. So, mm, very good, yummy, yummy, yummy. All right, so there's something I forgot to do though. Yeah, I forgot to do. You know what I forgot to do? I forgot <laughs> to coat the, the apple in lemon juice. Dull. should I do this whole video again? No. If you coat, the apple in lemon juice beforehand, well, number one, it's going to taste sour, but number two, it should stop the apple from browning, okay? So apples that have been cored, they'll go brown quite quickly, and so I didn't worry about the lemon juice because I sort of made it and ate it straight away, but if you're going to make it, make the, the apple almond candle and then wait a few hours, you probably want to coat it in lemon juice first because that will stop it from going brown. Now, you could do an experiment to see whether that actually works. You could do an apple core without lemon juice and an apple core with lemon juice and then compare them after two hours and see if indeed the lemon juice stops that from going brown. Now, that's what you call a science experiment. Okay, so there you go. That would be a good thing to do. All right. Next thing to do with candles, because candles, I'm, I'm just going to eat these almonds. Mm. Now, I shouldn't eat them straight off this table, but I know that this table's pretty clean, but still, it's not a great example. I need, I'm going to make a candle seesaw. I need something else. Let me just go get my something else. Back in a moment. All right. Now, you can do it with, I'm going to use two fancy conical flasks just so that you can see everything quite well, but you don't need these. You can try and do it with just two normal glasses, that's fine. And sometimes you'll see things on the internet that look quite simple. And you think, oh, I could give that a go and it'd be easy. Sometimes the things are not simple. And a candle seesaw is not simple, okay? So I'm going to attempt to make a candle seesaw with this candle. I think there's a little bit of an issue though, straight away, and that is that I think it's slightly tapered. I think the diameter of the base is bigger than the diameter of the top. So that's 19.67 millimeters, and up here it's 18.8. .8. So yes, it, there is a slight amount of tapering. So the very first thing I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to give this a little, just a little bit of a slice, not much, but I'm just going to remove a little bit of the tapering. Okay, so if you use a knife, always do the knife away from you. And they often say that a sharp knife is less dangerous than a blunt knife. It's always confused me because I'm thinking, you know, like a sharp knife is more likely to cut you open, isn't it? But then I think if you're using a blunt knife, then you're often forcing and that's when accidents happen. What I also need to do is I need to expose the wick on the bottom side of this candle. Okay, so now I'm, now I'm um, going to try and expose the wick on the bottom side. I'm making a bit of a mess here. Okay, so I'm trying to find the wick. Where are you, wick? You definitely need to have the wick. 
This, all right, here it comes. Here it comes. I can see it now. There's the wick there. Now, I need both sides to look somewhat similar. Okay, so I'm going to... And I'm sort of like pushing the knife with my thumb on this side. That's what I'm sort of doing. There we go. Uh, how similar does that look? Mm, a little bit. A little bit. And this, this wick is quite long, so I might just try and... There we go. Alright, just clean up my mess. <laughs> there we go, it's all clean now. I'm messy down there. So, I've got a candle that's fairly symmetrical. You're probably saying, Jacob, that's not symmetrical, but I think it's close enough. And what I'm going to do is try, and, try to measure the halfway point. Okay, the halfway point's fairly important. Oh, look at that, mine's about 15 centimetres long. And so, I'm going to just get my knife put a little mark at seven and a half centimeters there we go there's a little tiny mark there then I need to put a needle through it now I don't have a needle but I found a piece of wire I found a piece of wire and to push it through easier I'm just going to heat up the wire a little bit okay so light the candle light the match light the candle now, metal is a good conductor of heat. So, okay, I can see the little mark there. And I'm going to heat up this piece of wire. Now, don't forget that metal is a good conductor of heat. And so I don't want to, I don't want to cook my finger. And Let's see if I can push it through. Now, be very careful that you don't... Hmm. This is going to be interesting. Ow! Ow! It is hot. <laughs> Here I am saying be very, very careful because it's hot and then I go and hurt myself. Okay. Can I just push it through with pressure? Arr! This is not easy. This is maybe why I suggested the needle. Hmm. How far did I get it in? Okay, maybe, maybe I have to do little, little bits at a time. See this? Heat. Push. Heat. Push. Oh, I did it! I did it! Yay! I did it! I'm sounding surprised because I sort of am surprised. You're probably definitely going to need, probably definitely, I don't know whether how good a language that is. Um, Alright, so, what happens if I, hey, hey, <laughs> that's supposed to be balanced. Ugh. That's not very good balance, is it? I think I have to take off some of the weight of this side. Is that about right? What do you think? Take off some more weight. Maybe it's a little bit long. Oh, oh! Oh no, I've just chopped off the wick. That was not a good move at all. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I told you this was not easy. People sometimes don't believe me, but... Believe me, this is this is not easy. Okay, let's try that. That might be very, very close. Oh! Too far! Whee! Woohoo! <laughs> Around we go. <laughs> this time. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. It's very, very close. It's very, very close. Oh. Hey. Right. Look, tiny bit more, tiny bit more. Oop. Around. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm so close now. I'm so close. You 
do need it very, very close. That's a fact. Hey! Claps for Jacob. Claps for Jacob. All right. Okay. So here goes. Now, I should put a plate here to catch the, the drips, and I need another plate to catch the other side. Otherwise, I'll end up with, otherwise I'll end up with wax all over the table, which is not great. Okay, so let's light this side. And let's light this side. All right, let's see what happens. Drip, drip. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of a seesaw happening here. Interesting, isn't it? Tiny bit of a seesaw. Oh. What's gonna happen? Oh, maybe I might give more of a I'm a bit disappointed. I told you that. It's easy to it's easy to see something on a video, but then when you actually go and make it yourself. Oh, hang on. Here we go. Ah, oh, almost had a bit of a rhythm happening there. Is that was that cheating? I think that's it. Yay! I've done it! <gasps> oh, look at that! Look at that! Yay! Oh, this is incredible. I'm really loving this. If I put a little ant one ant there and one ant there, I could give them a ride, couldn't I? Like at a fun fair. Woo! We're learning about forces. We're learning about, about balance. We're learning about moments and talks. We're learning about reversible reactions. We're learning about irreversible reactions. Chemistry, physics. Hey. I like it a lot. If I blow out one side, what will happen now? What do you predict? What do you predict will happen? Alright. Okay. What's your prediction? Is this what you predict? Yeah, this side's dripping, so this side's getting lighter. So this side is heavier. And so that's why we've ended up like that. Okay, well, what a fantastic seesaw. That actually worked a lot better than I expected. Yay, fantastic. Okay. All right, so let's pop him away. And uh, I'm going to lick my fingers and then pinch the um, candle wax. Okay, there we go. Pinch my fingers. I lick my fingers so that they were cold. Okay, so I've got a question for you. I've got a question for you, which is this next thing. Um, oh, I'll just remove that, and I'm just going to cut the base off this candle, like this. And imagine you walked into an, a fairly empty room. Okay, imagine you walked into a fairly empty room, and there was a candle. Oh, I'm trying to balance the candle. I think I'm going to have to cheat a little bit. I oh, know, so there's a candle, 
And then there's a stopwatch. And then there's a ruler on a table. And the candle is burning. Okay, the candle is burning. Well, you don't have to imagine anything yet, because you can actually see it. Imagine you walk into a room and you see this, you know, a ruler, a candle, and a stopwatch. But then someone says to you, so, how long do you think the candle has been burning for? How long do you think the candle has been burning for? Hmm. It's an interesting question, isn't it? What are you thinking to yourself? Well, you might say, oh, I know those candles. I've seen those candles in the shop. And they start off as this long. Yeah? And then you say, and they only burn slowly. So you might say, maybe it's been burning for five hours. Just at a quick guess. Well, what could you do? What measurements could you do while you're standing here? Well, you could measure, couldn't you? how high the candle is. You can measure how high the candle is and then you could start your stopwatch, start the timer, come back in an hour, make a new measurement and see how far it's travelled down. Yeah? So you could say, oh, in one hour it's travelled two centimetres. And then you could say, well, if it's travelled um, two centimetres in one hour, that's that's one centimetre every half hour. And so if you say, well, if the original candle was 30 centimetres and it's gone down 15 centimetres, then 15 centimetres is, um, oh, I'm forgetting those numbers, but it's like seven and a half hours or something like that. I've probably got it wrong because in my mind I've forgotten the numbers, but do you know what I mean? But there's two big assumptions that you're making. Okay, there's two, do you know what the two big assumptions are that you're making? when you're doing this. An assumption is something that you think is right based on your past understanding, but doesn't necessarily mean it is true or right. So firstly, how do you know for sure what the original length was? You're just guessing that it was a 30 centimeter candle. How do you know it wasn't from a special shop and it was a meter long? How do you know that? How do you know it wasn't just a short little candle? Well, you're just, because you've made an assumption. And the assumption may be right, but it's also possibly wrong. There's another assumption that you might have made, and that is that it's burnt at the same rate the entire time. Well, maybe that's correct, but maybe it's not. Maybe earlier on, if it's a sealed room, maybe there was more oxygen to begin with. And so maybe it burnt more quickly to start with. And so it went really quickly. And now that all of the oxygen in the room is being used up, maybe that maybe it's burning a lot slower now. So, it's a good question, isn't it? Are you able to determine how long the candle's been burning for? Now, I raise this because it's got some significant consequences to our understanding of the world around us and ageing things. Sometimes we do have to be careful about what assumptions are made when we age things. Um, be it, you know, the, the, the number of rings on a tree, uh, the thickness of ice, and that sort of stuff. We have to be careful when we make assumptions about ageing things. Anyway, um, hopefully you've enjoyed that lesson, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this lesson, we're finally going to look and see how candles actually burn. Now, we have to set something up at the beginning of the lesson, and this is where you're going to need a two beakers from Junior Chemistry Set 1, and you'll need a beaker, the beaker, from Junior Chemistry Set number 2, so that you've got three beakers. Then um, I'm going to fill each beaker like this, just with 10 ml of water. Now some of you will have a wash bottle like this, um, but some will just be using other, other mechanisms. Now if you do have a wash bottle, 
Wash bottles are, you hold them vertical and then you squeeze them. Okay, you hold them vertical and then you squeeze them. Then, if you have some, I'm going to use one of the filter paper, but you can actually use paper towel for this from the kitchen. Okay, you can't use normal A4 paper. You need something, you need, you need some paper that's quite absorbent. And um, filter paper is quite absorbent. And I'm just cutting two lengths of filter paper uh, using the scissors. So they just have to be fairly long and skinny. And then I'm going to fold them sort of over like this. And I'm making a, a little bridge. Okay, a little bridge. Now I've got some food coloring. My favorite food coloring is the Queens, um, found in the, shop, uh, the, the cooking aisle of your supermarket. And you need it quite concentrated. Okay, I need quite a concentrated solution. So I just put in three drops there and one, two, three, four, five, six drops of food color, yellow there because the yellow is not as strong. And I should really mix that around. So from junior chemistry set number one, there's a stirring rod and we just give that a stir. The yellow one, I'm, going to t I'm just gonna dry the stirring rod and turn the stirring rod around so I don't contaminate it with the blue. And then I'll just dry it before I put it back in. There we go. And so now, I'm just gonna move it over here because I want this to proceed during the rest of the lesson. So let's pop that there, pop him in there, pop him in there, pop him in there, pop him in there. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a bridge. The bridge from the blue one to the colourless one and the bridge from the yellow one to the colourless one. And we'll refer back to that. All right, we've done a few lessons on lighting matches, on lighting candles and all that sort of stuff. And so something that we have to remember is what happens when we light a candle. Okay, we need some heat. Okay, and the heat comes from the fire of the match. Okay, so uh, there's heat in this fire, and heat is basically the agitation of molecules and particles. Particles make up everything around us. Everything is made up of particles, and those particles are jostling backwards and forth, jostle, jostle, jostle. This wooden table is made up of particles, and they're jostling. Ah, uh, the tablecloth, the water, they're all made up of particles and they're jostling. Now, the hotter you get them, the higher the temperature, the more jostling occurs. Now, when the heat jostles the solid wax, when the heat jostles the solid wax, we know, the, we know what happens, don't we? When the heat from the fire jostles the wax, the solid wax, it quickly goes into a liquid it turns into a liquid, and so it melts. So when you add heat to a solid and it turns to a liquid, that's called melting, okay, melting. But when it cools down, when it cools down, it goes back to a solid. That's called solidifying or solidification. So melting is going from a solid to a liquid and when you go from a liquid to a solid, that's called solidification. It takes heat, it takes heat to go from the solid to the liquid. And in actual fact, to go back from the liquid to the solid, it will actually give up that heat, it will release the heat. Now, if you have a liquid and you keep heating it, this is the important part, if you have a liquid and you keep heating it, it will turn into a gas. Now we can see that, and we're going to see that later on when we heat some water. You know, you've got a kettle at home, or I'm sure you've put some water into a, a pan and you've heated it before and you've seen like steam coming off. So when you heat a liquid and it turns to a gas, that's called evaporation, okay? That's called evaporation. And if you um, have a hot shower and that steam cools down on the mirror or the glass, that's called condensation. Oh, look, I just blew that out, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, 
And then finally, there's a slightly trickier one, and that is if you are a, a solid, and if I heat it up and it goes, instead of going into a liquid, it goes straight into a gas, that's actually called sublimation, sublimation. And dry ice goes straight from a solid substance to gaseous carbon dioxide. You might have heard of dry ice before. And then if you go from the, um, the gas straight to a solid, you get sublimation, and we're going to do that in a minute. So the changes of states are very important, you know, from a, from a liquid to a solid to a, or sorry, from a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a gas, and melting and then evaporating, those terms are very, very important, okay? So keep that in mind. Next, we've got what's called the fire triangle. Now, for the fire triangle, fire or combustion requires three things. It requires a fuel. Now, in this match, the, the wood and the chemicals are the fuel. It requires some heat. By me striking this um, strike plate, it generates some friction. So do this with your hands. When you rub your hands together, that's friction and that's a bit of heat. And so the fire triangle needs a little bit of heat and we get that from that friction. And then the fire triangle needs a third thing, and that's some oxygen. And the oxygen comes from the air. So do you remember when we put, remember when we put, and I can do it quickly again. I've got heat from the fire. I've got fuel from the wax. And if I go like this, and I put a glass jar over it, why does it go out? Does it go out because it runs out of wax? No. Does it go out because it runs out of heat? No. Why is it going to go out? It's going to go out because it's going to run out of oxygen. Okay, and it's running out right now. Ah, there we go. We removed oxygen from the fire triangle and so it went out. What about if I light the candle? And I wet my two fingers. So I'm going to just squirt a little bit of water on my two fingers like that. Okay, now I don't recommend you do this. But if I pinch that, that number one, it removes any oxygen while I'm squeezing it. And the, the water absorbs the heat. And so there's no heat. And so the fire goes out because it doesn't have any oxygen and it doesn't have any heat. Why does a match, why does a burnt match not burn? Okay, why does a burnt, why does a burnt match not burn? So here we go, I'm going to burn this match. Okay, I'm going to burn this match. I'm just going to get another one going. So I'm burning this match. Now, why can't I light this black part of the match? There's oxygen and there's heat. The problem is there was no fuel left to run out of fuel. Starting to get where we're coming from, okay? So we need to have we need to have um, some fuel, which is the candle, wax, or known as paraffin. We need to have some heat. Oh, silly me. We need to have some heat from the fire, okay, or from the match, and we need to have some oxygen. Where's the oxygen coming from? There's all these particles in the air and 20% of them are oxygen. So there's lots and lots of oxygen in the air. Okay, lots and lots. In fact, I could actually model that oxygen, okay, using, using these little, what we call a molly mod kit. Okay, now I've got a molly mod kit and if you really, really, really love science, you might consider getting a molly mod kit as well. Um, Tiny Science Lab doesn't currently sell them, or they might sell them now when you're watching it, but it, as on filming, they don't. But buzzing around, buzzing around us are oxygen molecules, okay? And oxygen molecules, like this, it's just a model. There's actually trillions around us. Oxygen models and molecules react with the, the paraffin, okay? Now, talking about paraffin, what does paraffin actually look like if I could build a model of paraffin using the molly mods? Glad you asked. I built a partial model. I ran out of hydrogen atoms because <laughs> my set didn't have enough. 
But if you have a look, these black balls here, these black balls represent carbon atoms, carbon atoms. And carbon takes three very interesting forms. It takes um, soot, graphite, and diamond. That's right, diamond rings are actually made from carbon atoms and see this black black on the match that's actually carbon atoms you can actually you can actually turn this black match into diamond i'm not joking you need special machinery high pressures and high temperatures and do it but it is possible to do it and so paraffin i think it's something like 16 carbon atoms long and each carbon atom is fully surrounded by a little white ball, and that white ball is called hydrogen. So it's actually called a hydrocarbon, okay, a hydrocarbon. Why is it called a hydrocarbon? Because it contains hydrogen and carbon atoms. So what's the reaction for when um, paraffin burns or wax burns? Well, you need paraffin, which is this molecule, so a fairly long molecule. You need oxygen, which is this molecule, and this paraffin molecules, there's trillions of these in candles, and the oxygen, there's trillions of these in the air, and they knock into each other, they knock into each other, and they cause bonds to be broken, okay? Bonds break, and then new bonds form, okay? Bonds break and new bonds form. And one of the things that's formed is, is water, Okay, one of the things that's formed is water. Another thing that's formed is carbon dioxide, okay, CO2. So you actually form carbon dioxide as well. And interestingly, interestingly, sometimes if there's not enough oxygen, if there's not enough oxygen, sometimes one of the products is just going to be carbon, just like that. Now, see how there's that orange flame? That's indicative that there's not enough oxygen in um, reacting with the paraffin wax. And so you're not fully combusting it. And so you're actually producing carbon atoms. Let me show you. If I get my plate, okay, if I get my plate, now hopefully this won't crack the plate, um, and I hold the, well, I just put it out. <laughs> Silly me. It's possible that the heat can crack the plate. So don't do it with like an expensive antique plate, whatever you do. So if I go like this, I'm actually depositing. There's that word, we came across it earlier on in the lesson. We actually, when we go straight from the gas to a solid, that's called deposition, okay? And so we're actually getting carbon atoms that are depositing onto this plate. And I can actually scrape them off and they're on my finger and I could actually wipe them under, under my eye. I could, you know, like do all sorts of interesting makeup things, but I won't, okay? But I won't. So, how are you going so far? This is this is complex stuff, isn't it? <laughs> why, wh why doesn't the um, I mean, why doesn't the wax and the oxygen just, you know, combine and start going on fire by itself? Because I mean, the ingredients are there. Why doesn't it happen? I'm glad you thought it. Well, if you didn't think it, I thought it. Let's say that this is a mountain. It's actually a plastic container, but it's actually a very helpful um, plastic container. And let's say that this is a giant boulder, and if I was to release it here, woo, it would roll down the mountain, woo, like that. But what about if the ball was sitting there? See how there's a little bit of a lip to go up and over? And once I've pushed it up and over that lip, then it rolls down the hill. That's a lot like having your paraffin there and your oxygen there it's just not quite enough not quite enough energy to be activated to to undergo the combustion it needs a little bit of a push the collisions need to be a little bit more energetic now do you remember how to get more energetic collisions you use heat and so basically lighting a candle lighting a candle is a lot like giving a, a, a boulder at the top of the cliff a little bit of a push. And then once you've given it a push, then it keeps rolling. That little push is called the activation energy. And notice that the particles or the boulder has a lot less energy once it's rolled down. 
Same thing as the paraffin wax. Once it's burnt and combined and produced carbon dioxide and water, those molecules have got a lot less energy than the, um, than the original molecule. So, oh, we're almost getting there. There's one more little thing. Okay, one more little thing. Where does the, the gas come from? Well, the, the, the paraffin, well, it travels, the liquid travels up the wick. Okay, the liquid travels up the wick. And that's why we've had this going for quite some time, but obviously not enough time, because I have got some blue that's traveled up the paper. See that blue there? But it hasn't traveled across yet. It hasn't traveled across yet. But the liquid wax actually travels up the wick. So the wick has to be made out of something that allows liquid to travel through it. So the liquid travels up the wick, and then the fire, the fire is hot enough to turn it into a gas. Okay, the fire is hot enough to turn it into a gas. And then that gas, there's enough heat there to ignite the gas. And so all those little demonstrations that we've done the last few lessons have all been working towards you, hopefully understanding how a um, a candle burns. And you can you know it's a, a gas burning there because the, let me do it again. Oh, remember it jumped down, I can't get it to jump down. Yeah, not very good. Now remember how I said, if you burn a burnt match, it won't light. See that, if you burn a burnt match, it won't light, but I'm actually going to dip it into the fuel. So I'm dipping it into the wax there. Let's have a little look, see what happens now. Hey, that's not the match burning. That's the candle wax burning. Look at that. And because, because there's such a big surface area, it really burns quite well. So will that match burn? Absolutely it will, because it's not the match that's burning. It's actually the wax that's gasifying, and it's actually the paraffin that's burning. Look at that. You could probably trick someone with a bit of a magic trick. You know, you could say, you could say to them, do you think I can make this match burn, and they'll look at it, and they won't see the wax, and they'll go, no, that won't burn, and then you can go, yes, it will. Hey, <laughs> all right, well, you might need, you might need to review the last few lessons. You might need to review this lesson. Um, these are big concepts. These are very big concepts, um, but important concepts to understanding science. It's okay if you don't understand them now. I'm not really expecting you to. I'm still, I still learn things about this sort of thing all the time. So, and I've been doing science, and I'm an old man. I've been doing science my whole life. So don't worry if you're not getting it. That's okay. But I bet you're getting it just a little bit, okay? And every time you do a bit more, you'll get a little bit more. And then one day you'll go, oh, I think I understand. And then you can actually apply that understanding to other things um, that are new to you. And that's what that's where learning really helps. If you've learned something, later on, you can apply that learning to a new um, situation. And that's called education. And I am all, a, well, I think education is hugely important, uh, particularly because it helps us learn about this wonderful world that we're in. Okay, anyway, thanks for joining me, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey kids, in this lesson, we're doing heating moments. Now you'll need your junior chemistry set too, tea light candles, some matches, you're going to need some skittles, um, going to need some ice cubes, some ice cubes. Now, you should have a little ice cube tray from um, Junior Chemistry Set 1. If you don't have this, then you'll have to just break up some larger ice cubes. So it's not a disaster, just break up some bigger ice cubes and make them small enough to fit into the um, beaker. I'll pop up when I'm ready to go get my ice cubes that are in the freezer. Uh, you'll need a sharp knife, so a bit of adult supervision. Um, some of the filter paper. Now, if you don't have filter paper, you can do this on normal A4 paper. Okay, you can do this on normal A4 printer paper. And a lemon. Now, I was lucky because 
I've got a lemon tree and normally there's lemons on it, but this time there was no lemons on it, but I found one lonely little lemon dying away on the ground. So I'm hoping that this lemon will be all right. Okay, so let's clear the table a little bit and you're going to get out your uh, heating component, your heating burner thing. What are we going to call it? Uh, the heating mesh, the tripod. I don't really have a name for it. Um, how about the heating stand? That's probably the, one of the better names. And just be careful that they're, so they're pointy, yeah? And they could like stab you, the, the edges. So just be careful um, that they don't stab you. And if you've got any that are like extrude, you know, like coming out, you can actually like cut them with a good pair of scissors, believe it or not. You can trim them up. Now, I'm going to sort of get that nice and ready before I heat it up. So that feels about right. That looks pretty good. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm also going to get my tweezers ready. Okay, so it's a good idea to get your tweezers ready. Remember, there's a little loop. Take that little loop off and put it in the back in the container. That way you know where it is. Because the tweezers are very good for moving hot things around. So it's good to have a little bit of a practice moving hot things around so that you don't burn yourself later on. If you practice doing it now, if you practice doing it now, there's less chance that you'll burn yourself later. Um, so I've got my safety goggles ready. And so I am going to get some ice cubes because it's not a good idea to heat empty glassware. If you heat empty glassware, more than likely it will crack. So don't heat empty glassware. I'm just gonna go get the ice. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, I'm back with my ice cube tray. Now, if you put water in the freezer, the temperature of the water will cool down. Let's say it starts at 15 degrees Celsius. It'll go 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Now, 4 degrees, something interesting is going to happen to the water, but I'm not going to tell you what. Uh, then it keeps cooling down, 3, 2, 1, 0. And at 0, do you know what happens to the water? The particles have slowed down so much that, that they turn from a liquid to a solid. Now, if I told, asked you how what the temperature of the ice was, you might say 0. But the answer is wrong. You can keep cooling it. If the freezer is cooler than zero, and almost all freezers are, it will keep cooling. In fact, I think this cools down to minus 16 degrees. But as soon as it's out of the freezer, it goes up. Minus 16, minus 15, minus 14, minus 13, minus 12, till it gets to zero, and then you know what we'll do? Start melting again. So <laughs> I'll just pop that there. Let's get the uh, goggles on. And now for a very exciting moment. Now, you might, this is exciting for me because I guess, you know, this, this is my invention. I, I did invent this. You know, I'm pretty sure no one else has invented this where um, you take a, a little tea light candle, you put a little mesh over it, and then all of a sudden you've got a little heating unit, very safe heating unit for heating stuff. Um, People have obviously, over the years, have made um, what, what we call methylated spirits burners or spirit burners, but I've, I don't think they're very safe. And so I think this is a lot better, a lot easier and a lot safer to use and very, very effective. And so straight away, remember how we learned earlier on when we did the um, observations of the candle, how the heat goes like straight up? Well, I've put the, the candle, um, not the candle, I've put the beakers immediately above the, the, um, the flame there. And my observations are that the solid, the solid ice cube is melting. Okay, I can see some liquid under there. And I can actually see the height of the ice cubes going down. Okay, I might even get a nice close-up of that. What do you think? Look at that. I can actually see... Oh, whoa, that was a big, um, like, it collapsed there, didn't it? In fact, all the air's gone now, so hardly any... There's hardly any room left in... Uh, whoa, got a little bit more movement there. 
This is cool, isn't it? Now, interestingly, the ice has to melt first before the temperature of the water increases. Now, you have to take my word for that. So what did I just say? The First of all, the ice has to all melt. This is theoretically, of course. And then once all the ice is melted, then the water will start rising in temperature. How's yours going? If I want to move it around a little bit, I need to use the tweezers. There we go. This is a, the wire gauze is doing two things. The wire gauze allows the beaker to sit up above the candle, but the wire gauze is also dispersing the heat a little bit, dispersing the heat. And I've just noticed that the wire gauze is actually doing one other thing, and that is it's preventing the entire bottom of the beaker from going black. I'm sure part of it's going black underneath, but certainly not the entire, um, not the entire beaker. Now, if you go to your junior chemistry set one, if you go to your junior chemistry set one, you should have a thermometer in there, a digital thermometer. Now, if your batteries happen to be flat, you can actually get new um, batteries from Tiny Science Lab. They're LR44 batteries. And we do, I think, $1 postage on the batteries. And the batteries are not very expensive, okay? So, yeah, the batteries are cheap to replace. Very, very good way to, to read the temperature. 48 degrees, you might be able, I think you'll be able to see it there. I've got a light there, which you can see reflecting on my glasses, and that actually helps you see the um, numbers on the, the temperature probe. Ah, 57 degrees. Now, I invented that um, heat stand. I was... I wanted a way to heat up the beakers and I've got a laser cutter as you might know and I started uh, making sort of a bit of a sort of a stand from some wood and some wire gauze where I was going to fit the wire gauze to the wood because I had in mind a piece of wire gauze and that it needed to be held up by the the, the timber so I had wire gauze I had the timber I had the laser cutter and I was thinking about and then all of a sudden it struck me that if I just made the wire gauze a little bit longer, I could actually fold it and actually have the, the legs. So I didn't wake up one morning with this in my brain. Okay? I, I started trying a few different things, putting a few things together and happened to have the mesh. So one thing I like is I like having stuff around, like things that I've pulled apart, um, you know, little bottles of screws and little containers of little plastic mo of motors and some speakers and some wires because it makes um, creating things a lot easier if you've got things on hand. I've also learnt a lot from pulling things apart, toys apart, electrical things apart. Do it safely, of course, um, and never, um, never have like a 240 volt, like a house household item plugged in. Um, because that is going to be a big problem. Now, obviously, oh, I can see some bubbles forming. Now, that's not actually steam; that's actually air coming out of the um, out of the water there. Now, what temperature? We're at sixty-nine degrees, seventy-eight, seventy-eight degrees, eighty-three degrees, eighty-six degrees. Now, I know that some of you might be thinking, "Oh, this is so boring," but it's not. It's not boring. It's exciting. It's exciting being able to boil some liquid in a glass beaker in front of you with a tea light candle. That's exciting. Because you're probably the first kids in history to be able to do something like this. This is wonderful. Think of all the things that you'll be able to explore with. You'll be able to put flowers in there and extract their perf oh I just blew that out extract their perfumes you'll be able to heat up different 
concoctions. What I might do is I might keep that match there. You know what I could even do? I might even put another match there. Dip it into, um, whoa, I'm accelerating this now. Look at that, I'm cheating. And have a look at that. Whoa, now, if that doesn't excite you, I don't think anything will excite you. Look at it boiling away. Look at the bubbles, look at the steam. We started with the solid, solid ice cubes. We added heat and then the particles uh, went faster and faster and then they started moving apart each other and they turned into a liquid. And then we kept heating that liquid and the temperature went up and the particles went even faster. And then the particles sort of like phew, leapt out and turned into a gas. And in fact, I can see that gas uh, condensing again, going back into a liquid. That's what that steam is. And I can also see it forming on the side. Now, what temperature? What temperature do you think this is? Have a guess. Okay. Do you know? I know what temperature it is. It will be very, very close to 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, very, very close. How do I know that? Because water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure. 97. It will be a little tiny bit under that. Okay, because mainly because my probe doesn't go all the way in, but 98, I bet it will go to like 98.5 or something like that. 98.4, come on, 98.5, 98.6, yeah, how good is that? Fantastic. So I might just blow that out and I'll just let it cool down for a little bit. You don't have to let it cool down for long. Okay, all right, because I can tell you that there's actually not that much heat energy. A lot of the heat actually has gone out into the atmosphere. And so this is hot and I can easily put this on my ceramic dish if I want. And if I was to give that a little bit of a wave around, that will, that will, that will be quite cool. Now I can actually see the carbon deposition on the bottom of that, okay? And I will have some carbon deposition on the uh, beaker, but you'll be able to wipe that off. So Now, um, what type of change was this? Was this a reversible or an irreversible change? Well, it's a reversible change, of course. Okay, reversible change. Now, it's time to heat a Skittle. Now, I actually just went to the shops to buy these Skittles. And there was a big bag of Skittles, 250 grams, $5.40. I thought, whoa, that's expensive. That's expensive. Now, Skittles are actually made about a 40 minute drive from me, south down towards Sydney in a suburb called Hornsby. And I know some of the factory workers there. And guess what? Skittles are very, very difficult to make. They are incredibly difficult to make. You have to um, heat the sugars, cool the sugars, temper the sugars. And when, when the process is actually finished, the Skittles are actually as hard as a rock. They break your teeth. So they actually have to get stored for some time and then some slow chemical reactions occur in the center that actually make the center soft. I bet you didn't know that, eh? All right, so I must admit, I really actually do like Skittles. Um, they're probably one of my favorite lollies. I'm gonna start with the yellow one, actually. Now, if you don't have a Skittle, you could try an M&M. You could cut up a little bit of any lolly, okay? You don't have to have a Skittle to do something similar to this, okay? Now, in the plastic container, there's a steel pan, okay? so. You get the steel pan out. The steel pan is the more dense of the two. One's aluminium and one's steel. And if you actually go to chemistry set number one, there's a magnet. There's a magnet in here. And the steel pan is actually magnetic, whereas the aluminium pan is not magnetic. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pop that there. I'm going to light my Bunsen burner. So 
So I light my Bunsen burner again. My Bunsen burner? It's not my Bunsen burner. It's my candle. And then bring this over here. And you know what? We actually need, we actually need the stirring rod from set number one as well. So I need to get the stirring rod out, the glass stirring out rod wrap from set number one. And put the pan on so the pan will be getting hot. And I'm going to pop the skittle on. On goes the skittle. What is going to happen? What's your prediction? Hmm? Hmm. Make sure you've got your hair tied back. Make sure you've got your gold. Oh, it's starting to slide a little bit. It slid a little bit. That means somehow there was less friction and it started sliding downhill. Now, why would there be less friction? Because it's turning into a liquid. Okay, the bottom of it is turning from a solid into a liquid and I can see a bit of that yellow. Oh, I can actually see some bubbles now. So I would say that we're undergoing what's called a reversible change right at this moment. We're actually going from a solid to a liquid and without too much effort, we could reverse that by going back to the solid. Because the colour is fairly similar of that liquid to the actual lolly, although it is now getting a little bit brown. Okay, it's getting a little bit brown now. So we're actually moving into what we would say a irreversible change. Okay, an irreversible change where, well, it's starting to go black or dark brown, the bubbles are quite thick. Now that will be super hot, okay? That will be super, super hot. You don't want to get this bubbling liquid um, molten material on you, okay? It will really hurt. You'd have to get that under cold water super, super, super fast. So goggles, definitely. Make sure you're wearing safety glasses, it's particularly because, who knows, it might go, it might, you know, sort of squirt a little bit. Um, I'm going to do some wafting. Mmm, I'm getting some very nice wafting here. Now you're getting a good view from the top. Okay, you're getting a very good camera view here from the top. You're probably seeing a little bit of wafting coming towards the camera as well. Look at that, some big bloop, 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 bloop. So we started with a reversible change, but it's quickly become an irreversible change. Oh, I like it. Look at those big, oh, you can see the bubbles growing and then they burst and then they release some of the smoke. Yeah, bloop, bloop. I wonder if you cooled this down, what it would taste like. I bet it would taste like um, burnt lemon toffee, something like that. Do you think it'd be like burnt lemon toffee? Now, this, this sort of material will be difficult to wash off. But if you soak it, if you soak it in water, it will be a lot easier. I can absolutely assure you of that. If you soak this burnt sugar, because that's really what Skittles are, mainly sugar, some flavours, a bit of colouring, that's what Skittles are. Uh, but if you burn it, burn the sugar, and it becomes black and crusty, then if you soak it overnight in some water, um, it should dissolve. Now, what colour did I just say? Black. We're heating it up and it's going black. What does that indicate? What do you think sugar might be made out of? Remember candles? When we've got the, the fire from the candle and we're heating up the bottom of this dish. Remember this dish here? Oh, oh there we go. There's still a bit of black on there. Remember that's carbon? Well, sugar contains a lot of carbon as well. In fact, sugar is a hydrocarbon. You probably call it a hydrocarbonate because there's actually oxygen as well. Now, this is turning into like a giant monster, isn't it? I might actually blow that out. Very, very interesting. This will be super, super hot. Okay, super, super hot. So I'm actually just, I'm going to use my tweezers and I'm just going to move it out of the way like that. Yeah, I really like that. So now I'm actually going to show you a skill. Okay, I'm going to show you a skill. 
And that skill is actually how to heat a substance in a test tube. Now we're just going to heat um, just a little bit of coloured water. So I'm just trying to get out the peg here. There we go, I've got the peg. And I'm going to hold the test tube in the peg. Now don't forget, you can actually use your, your little ice cube tray to hold your cold... Actually, you could probably put fairly hot test tubes in there because it's made out of silicon. So that's probably going to be all right too. Oh, the, um, the, the Skittle has turned into a black, like a black solid puddle. Huh, black solid puddle. All right, so I need a little bit of water in my test tube. I'm not going to put much in and I might even put a little bit of yellow food coloring. I could put blue, but that would be too strong, I think, for that small amount of water. So I've got a small amount of uh, water with a tiny bit of food coloring. And, oh, see, I'll just pop it in the stand there while I light my uh, little candle. There we go. Let lay him up. And action. Here we go. So, you wiggle. When you're heating something up in a test tube, the trick is wiggle, 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 wiggle. Okay? How do you heat it up? Wiggle, 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 wiggle. Like this. Also, note the direction I'm aiming. I'm aiming the test tube. See, right now I'm aiming it towards the camera. Why do you think it's a good idea to aim it towards the camera and not to me? Because if I aim it towards myself, what if something spurted out? Something hot might spurt out, yeah? Well, that would burn me. So I always point it away from myself and I never point it at anybody else, basically. Okay. Now, this is, this is a little bit of a slow process. If I want to boil this um, water, Okay, it's not going to take too long. Okay, it's not going to take too long. But I'm going to keep wiggling it. I can see, oh, I felt the first sort of like boil. Okay, but I, I felt, I, I can feel it. You can actually feel it when it starts boiling. What you're actually feeling is that the steam, the steam molecules, the first steam molecules are actually condensing and they sort of, I guess they implode a little bit. And so, bop, 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 bop. Now I'm getting some good boiling happening. You can sort of see it going up the tube. I won't move it so much at the moment. That way you can see it. But you should keep it moving all the time. And I can actually see a bit of steam coming out there as well. Hey, I like it. I like that a lot. It's very interesting, isn't it? Now you know how to heat something up in a test tube. And remember the golden rule for when you're heating up glassware? Never heat an empty piece of glassware. So never heat a um, empty test tube, okay? So I'll just blow that out and I'll move him away. Now there's actually a little bit of frozen like cold water in my, so I'm actually just going to put it, I'm going to cool it down in that little bit of water. There we go. Perfectly safe, excellent, okay. So, one more thing in this lesson, and that is secret messages. Secret messages. And for that, you're going to need your lemon. I might just clean up this bench a little bit so it's not so messy. You're going to need your lemon. And there you go, that's really cleaned up. I might actually use this plate because I'm going to squeeze onto the plate. So. Hopefully I've got some lemon juice in here. So hopefully it's not all brown. It looks all right, actually. Yeah, that was a relief. So squeezing some lemon juice like that. And I'll look from, from number, set number one. I'm going to get the funnel and the beaker. And I'm going to pour the lemon juice into the funnel. There we go. Good. So now I've got some uh, lemon juice in the beaker. 
Then I need a piece of filter paper and my I need my stirring rod. And I'm going to draw a secret message on my filter paper. So I get my stirring rod and I wet my stirring rod and then I go and I start drawing my secret message. Now, I can't tell you what it is because otherwise it's not secret, correct? All right, so I'm, I'm drawing my secret message. There we go. Put plenty on. All right. Very good. And I might wave it around for a little bit. What do you think I'm waving it around for? Well, that will help evaporate the water, okay, and leaving behind like the sugars and the citric and that sort of stuff. So I'm waving it around. Okay, now it's probably best if I was to put this out in the sun or something like that. Okay, that's what would be best. But I don't really have the time, do I? Um, and I'm fairly certain this will still work. Actually, no, I'm going to go put it in the sun just for a minute. Okay, I'm going to put it in the sun for a minute. I'll be back in a minute or two. I'm back. Okay, three minutes in the sun. And you can't really see the message. I hope. And let's see if this works. <laughs> I remember doing it as a kid and it working. So now I don't know whether I used a flame to heat it up, but anyway, let's see what happens. Now we want we don't we want to heat it up gently, okay? We don't want it to catch on fire. So will the message Will the message be revealed, or will this be a disaster? Here we go! Oh. Will the message be... revealed? Oh! Might work better with an iron, but it actually is working. It actually is working. Like, this is working. Not, like, absolutely brilliantly. Or actually, you know what? <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm absolutely... At first I thought, no, no, this is just because I'm burning it in certain places. But it's not. It's not because I'm burning it in certain places. Okay? All right. This is how I feel about science. Yay! I'm a clown. No, I'm, it's supposed to be a happy face. See? <laughs> what sort of change do you think, think that is? Reversible or irreversible? Yeah, definitely irreversible. Oh... Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, hopefully you're enjoying this course as much as I'm enjoying it. How good's that? Hopefully you wrote something like, I love you, mum, or something like that. Um, that's a good secret message. But don't make it a secret message. You should tell your mum and your dad that you love them or your brothers and sisters, okay? All right. Okay, well, thanks for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey kids, in this lesson we're going to be looking at something called diffusion. Diffusion. That sounds a little bit like there's some confusion, but no, it's just diffusion. <laughs> now if you've got a smelly brother or sister and they come and stand like in your room, eventually you'll smell them. And that's because their smells are diffusing through the air. If we fill this um, conical flask up with water, and put a drop of food colouring, eventually that food colouring will spread through that water by a process called diffusion. Basically, the molecules of um, blue food colouring will spread through the molecules of water. And we're actually going to try and find out whether changing the temperature actually changes the speed or the rate of diffusion. So we're going to need um, your chemistry set two, uh, some food colour, 
You will need your candle and your matches and some water and a stopwatch, okay? And a stopwatch. You can use a mobile phone, that's, that's perfectly fine. Now, I'm just going to put some water in this um, conical flask and I'll just let it wait just for a moment. Um, I've put in a lot there. Wow, that was sort of overfilled. And I'm going to get my stopwatch ready and I'm actually going to do my results on the sheet. I'll put it here so that you can actually see me drawing the results. I've got an overhead camera and I think I'm ready to go. Okay, so I might just move this here, clear the table a little bit so it's not too messy. All right, here we go. Action. All right, I've started the stopwatch. The drop sort of shot down to the bottom. Um, the food coloring appears to be more dense than the um, water. That's quite interesting. I've got a few streaks, okay, and I've got a little bit of a, um, a cloud of it above the, above the bottom of the water. So, very interesting, okay, very interesting. And at one minute, I'm going to draw it. So I'm going to get ready to draw it, okay. Um, definitely, there's a dark patch can't draw it yet because I'm not at a minute. I want to draw it at exactly a minute. There's a dark patch, but it's quite low. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so there's definitely a dark patch down the bottom. It's quite dark. And then there's a bit of a wisp up here, some wisps like this. And I'll go like that, coming up to the top. And then I'll bring this down here like that. There we go. That, that's what it looked like at one minute. Now it is changing constantly. Okay, it is changing constantly. Uh, the, this, this part here is actually sort of spreading out a bit further out. And very soon we're going to be at two minutes. It's quite clear. It's quite clear that I'm still going to have that base. Okay, so I don't want to draw it till I get to the two minute mark because I want it to be fair. Four, three, two, one, okay. So now I'm going to try and draw it what it looked at exactly the two minute mark. Now it is definitely bluer down here as a wider, as a wider thing, yeah? And it's not as streaky. It's not as streaky, it's sort of like a more fuller blue. There we go, I'm trying to represent it as fairly as I can with a ballpoint pen. Maybe maybe a pencil might have been a little bit better. Uh, I, I'd classify this as fairly slow diffusion, okay? Um, that's for sure. I'd definitely say that the diffusion is quite slow, and but it is what it is. And our job is just to report what we see, okay? I don't want to try and make things up. Now, I know it's difficult for you to see this, but I'm hoping that you're doing it yourself. This course is actually designed not just to watch me do it, but it's actually, it's actually designed for you, me just to be a bit of a guide, okay? And I'm hoping that you're sort of relying more on your own results than on my results. So we've definitely got more spread out, but it doesn't look like, it. it's a little bit darker. On, the darkness on the bottom is coming up, but not by much. It really seems to have like settled on the bottom. And what the, what's actually causing the rest to go blue is actually the bit of food coloring that was sort of, as it traveled through the water, the bit of food coloring that was sort of like the remnants of it, I guess. The remnants of it, I guess. So we're at um, about five, we're at, this is almost the four minute mark. Here we go, three, two, one. There's very little change. 
very little change from the there's a little bit more of a mound here in the middle but very little change from what we saw before and I'd say that it's quite blue throughout I think that I don't think there's going to be much change after a long time to be honest it would be interesting to try to repeat this with a different colored food coloring yeah that's that would be interesting to, to repeat it with a different because maybe the different colored food colorings have got a different density yeah so that's something that you could think about doing as a further experiment not just do it with blue but try it with red or green or yellow or yeah okay and this is the five minute mark and essentially essentially there's little change okay all right so will there be a difference if we use hotter water that's the question so I'm going to tip out, okay, I'm going to tip out that water, give it a little bit of a, a rinse, okay, give it a rinse, get rid of any blue, we don't want any blue, that's for sure. I'm going to fill that up. Now, I'm not going to heat the conical flask, I'm actually going to heat a beaker. So let's get a fire going. Now you could use um, water from the kettle, you could use water from the tap, but I've got this equipment. Oh. oh, maybe it's not lighting because I don't have my safety goggles on. <laughs> there we go. Light the candle. Pop him here, get my beaker. Whoa! Oh, wow. Okay, so isn't that interesting? A um, five mil beaker, a five mil measuring seat cylinder almost filled up a 10 mil beaker. So that five mil is not a very accurate five mil. Okay, so and Typically, conical flasks are, are not, and beakers are not accurate uh, measuring devices for volume. Okay, we don't we don't use them for accurate measuring devices. Um, we actually use like measuring cylinders, and we use something called a volumetric flask. They're okay for rough volumes, but obviously not very good for small volumes because <laughs> five mil almost filled up a ten mil beaker. So either one's wrong or they're both, no, they'll both be wrong, that's for sure. So how hot do we actually want it? What temperature do we actually want it to go to? That's a good question. Um, hmm, let me think. I think maybe 50 degrees. I think 50 degrees ought to, ought to be ample, okay? So temperature now. Uh, if I give this a bit of a stir, 43, 47, 47. Oh, it's already at 50 degrees. Wow. It is really fantastic, isn't it? 54, 55, 55. It's so good. I think 60 degrees is fine because when I actually transfer it to the conical flask, it will cool down quite quickly. So I'll blow that out and pour that in. There we go. And here we go. I want to top it up just a tiny, tiny bit. Excellent. And I need my food colouring. Here it is. I need my stopwatch. Oh. There we go. And put my drop in. 
Okay, I started my... Ah, oh, that was really cool. You didn't see it, but it went down, and I think it sort of formed like a donut shape uh, quite quickly. Now, I also need to get my pen on already. So now we've got hot water, hot water. And straight away, I can see a difference. I'm going to take my glasses off so that I can see this a bit better. But am I getting... It's sort of, sort of mainly gone blue already. Okay, I can see that the diffusion of the dye, the diffusion of the dye as it travelled down, um, has already sort of spread out. So it's a little bit colourless down at the bottom. So fifty cent. Here we go. So I've got this. I've still I've got this big dark patch of blue down here, but. It's actually spread throughout the whole thing, but I will put a little bit of a little bit of an empty patch there that there was no blue in that sort of zone there. Ah, this is interesting. Okay, now I can actually see some blue coming up off the bottom. All right. Yep. Definitely, this time I can actually see blue coming up off the bottom. So I'll be able to draw that. It's like a mountain. It's like a mountain is growing. That's totally different from um, what happened when it was cold. So in about 10 seconds I can draw it. Ah, very, very different. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so this time I've got like this mountain that's hugely different than when it was cold and i've got a very even spread of blue throughout the entire conical flask so what i'm actually expecting now i'm actually expecting this central peak to go up um and then to sort of spread out so i'm expecting the central peak to go up and then getting a spread out like so that's unreal. Yeah, very, very interesting. Has temperature made a difference? Absolutely. Absolutely, temperature's made a difference. It has sped up the diffusion process. Not, I don't think there's going to be a lot of change, actually, in that last minute. Okay, in that last minute, I'm going to, in three, two, one... I'll say it's a bit thicker here, and it's gone a little bit higher, but not a huge change, okay? Not a huge change, just a... And that colour is a little bit more dilute there because you've actually spread out, but then definitely it's a similar spread of blue throughout the whole thing. And I can see that central peak going up. Definitely, that central peak is going up. And around it, around it, it is getting a little bit darker blue. Okay, around it. Now, why would a hotter temperature increase the speed of diffusion? Well, you know what heat is? Heat is actually the molecular motion of the particles. And the hotter it is, the faster the particles are moving. And so, can you imagine that there's more collisions between the water molecules and the and the ink and the dye molecules and so there's more bumping and more jostling and so you're expecting you're expecting them to spread apart okay so that's at the four minutes marks four minutes marks and this has definitely gone higher and this is going a bit wider like that we're at like that we've got the blue here and we're definitely spread out and i'm going to put a few more lines here because it is a little bit darker like that okay yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. And we've got one more minute. Okay, one more 30 seconds left, really. And I I can see that probably, oh, maybe within an hour or something, that this would probably fool you. Don't forget, though, it is cooling down. This is not... This is actually much, much cooler five minutes later than it was. So... In actual fact, in about 10 minutes, it will probably be the same temperature as the cold one anyway. Five, four, three, two, one, and a slightly 
higher like this and there we go so there we go was there a difference absolutely there was a difference the diffusion happened more quickly um, in the higher temperature can you explain why well it's all to do with the particle motion and that the hotter the temperature the faster the particles kinetic particle theory the word kinetic means movement particle means everything is made of particles and theory is like a big idea and so this of course represents a solid okay these particles here represent a solid and you can see that they are in a they're in fixed positions they're in a, a this is actually like a crystal actually they're in very a regular arrangement but they'll actually be vibrating about amongst the, uh, about their fixed position like just like I'm on my seat but I'm sort of moving around a little bit right even though they're in the same position it doesn't mean they're not moving they are jostling around if you add heat if you add heat they'll jostle more and more and more and they'll start breaking apart and so that's what you've got here. You've got these particles and they're sliding over each other and they're moving about. And if you give them even more energy, then they'll turn into a gas. And then those particles will like zip out and actually leave. They'll exert it. If you put a lid on it, they could exert a high pressure as well. Anyway, um, does temperature affect the diffusion? Absolutely. The higher the temperature, the greater the diffusion rate. Hopefully you've enjoyed the lesson, that you've learned a little bit. You can keep experimenting. You can try some different colour dyes, see what happens. Okay, bye for now. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. In this lesson, we're going to be doing something called concentration layers and heating. Now, it's just an idea that I've had. Um, I haven't actually done this experiment before, and I'm not lying to you all right often i'll be doing like some science show i've got all these experiments lined up and halfway through i'll go i wonder if i what would happen if i do this now i only do it if i know it's 100 percent safe right but i do try new things in strange places and times you know you think i'd probably know for an important course like this that this would all be rehearsed and practiced and all the rest of it well no no this is this is new well half of it's new um the first part i know what happens the second part no idea i've got some theories and some predictions but i don't know we'll find out um you're going to need salt and some food coloring for this and five tiny spoons so grab your tiny spoon from set number one and get five spoons of, little spoons of salt. I think that's about half a teaspoon, okay? And we're going to dissolve that in some water. So there we go, I've just got that in a dry beaker and I'm just going to squirt in about five mil of water, okay? So half a beaker of water and I need to get the stirring rod from set number one and give that a good stir to dissolve okay so this five little spoons in five mil of water is going to be a fairly concentrated mix okay and table salt the um, chemical name is called sodium chloride sodium chloride and when it dissolves the sodium chloride actually breaks up into sodium ions and chloride ions and their little charged particles and that will actually taste, this will taste very, very salty. Okay, very, very salty. Make sure it's fully dissolved. You should not see any crystals. And don't, when you stir, don't bang. Don't bang the um, beaker because you'll end up breaking the beaker and then you'll have to buy a new one from Tiny Science Lab, um, which isn't a disaster, but it will cost a couple of dollars. The real pain is the postage, to be frank. Um, <laughs> I mean, nobody really minds a couple of dollars, but when you add the postage in, ah, uh, pain in the neck. Okay, so there we go. I've got a, it's not quite clear, but, and it's not quite colorless. It's got a slightly milky, slightly milky look, but not too much. Now, the, this is the hard bit. The hard bit is, uh, get the pipette, get the pipette, and you need to get some more fresh water. Okay, more fresh water. 
just give this little beaker a little bit of a wash. There we go. There's the washing up done for the day. And this is the tricky bit. You have to add five mil of fresh water without disturbing the salty water. So I'm actually going to try and just run it very gently down the side of the beaker. Now I'll be able to see how well I've done this in a moment. Okay, so slowly, you can hardly see that I'm adding it, but I'm, I am adding it just very, very slowly. Get another big pipetful and squeeze it in more. Now, you gotta take my word for it that it, the water is going in, okay? trying to do it gently because I'm trying to avoid mixing off the fresh water with the salt water. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to avoid mixing. Some mixing will occur and that's okay. All right. I think that ought to do it. Beautiful. Then I'm going to pop it up here on the heating stand. And let's just give it a moment, a moment just for the molecules to stop moving around due to the agitation of being poured in, right? So there'll, there'll still be movement because uh, there is heat. There is, even though it's not hot, well, compared to absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius, you'd probably say that's very hot. But compared to a, a blowtorch, it's not very hot at all. But the particles will be moving around, like liquid particles do move around, but... I want to stop the, the wait for the big movement to slow down and come to a stop. And then something very interesting happens, or hopefully happens, when you start putting in some drops of food coloring. Okay? So, one. I did, a, I did a blue. Now I'm going to do a green. And I can see that I have had success here. I have had success because the food colouring sort of like hits this mysterious barrier. And that mysterious barrier, well, it's not so mysterious because I know the mysterious barrier is salt water. So if you want to have a quick look at that, I'll put a little bit of a white background behind it. See that? So now we've got a white background behind it, so you'll be able to see that quite well. And that's quite beautiful. That's what yours should look like. Okay, yours should look like that. The four colours are going to um, mix together. They are going to diffuse together. But notice that they're not diffusing into the salt water. So I'm perfectly aware of this. I've done this before. But the big question is, what will happen if we put some fire under it? Right? That's what I, that's what I don't know what's going to happen. I know the salt water will heat up. I know that hot water rises. Okay, I know that hot water rises. Um, and so I'm expecting, I don't know, I guess I'm expecting some water, hot water to go up and causing maybe, well, what do you think? What do you think? Pause the video and have a chat with, hopefully there's some people around you. Go and ask them, say, what do you think is going to happen? Really good to make a prediction. It's okay if you're wrong. Okay, it's okay if you're wrong. That's all right. I might even, I'm going to actually put a white sheet behind this. Um, as I do it so that we can actually, you'll be able to see it very good on the camera. So here we go. I think, I think the salt water will go up in the middle and that will cause, I think that will cause the colours to come down around the sides and that the, the colours will go down to the bottom. That's my prediction. Okay, so I've got a prediction. Now I can test the prediction. I'm going to push this in slowly. And in we go. Let's see what happens. I can't see anything yet. Okay, I can't see anything yet. Um, I can't even see any movement of the, the water at all yet. I thought I would have seen some movement by now. I don't need these goggles. I can't really see properly with them on that well. I see nothing yet. I see a bit of a blurring down the bottom. It's a little bit blurry. If 
probably would have helped if I didn't have the scales in your what you're looking at. I wonder if I can just rotate that a little bit without affecting it too much. Yeah, that's okay. Phew. Okay. I would have thought something would have happened by now. I'm trying not to talk because I don't want my breath to blow out and we'll move the candle flame. I certainly would have predicted that something would have happened a lot faster. I'm, I am surprised. I almost feel like the salt water is almost going to boil before any visual thing happens. The colours are mixing up the top, that's for sure. I'm actually getting some boiling, but no movement of the colours. I, I'm literally shocked. I'm literally shocked. I'd almost say that this is boring, but fascinating at the same time. Now we're sort of getting, now, the, col the colours are definitely all diffused together now. It has sped up. Oh, and now the colours are just coming down as a solid. Whoop. That, that was not what I expected at all. I did not expect that. I did not predict that. That was weird. That was weird. So I'd have to say, totally, totally different to my prediction. Number one, it took a long time before something happened. Number two, the salt water was almost boiling before anything happened. And then the colours up the top diffused together to form like a dark, very dark colour. And then the colour sort of just went down. There you go. That would be very interesting to model um, from a scientific perspective to try and explain that. That is, that's not what I expected at all. There'd be a lot of um, further investigation um, to, add to to look into this. Uh, rather than doing half-half, uh, what about if it was three-quarters salt and, or one-quarter fresh water or, or a quarter salt and three-quarter fresh water? What if it wasn't as concentrated salt? Um, lots of interesting things. Well, you know, we haven't really um, learned any real scientific principles this lesson apart from the... Um, salt water forms a barrier that the fresh water doesn't um, come into, but that was interesting. Well, anyway, I found it interesting. Hopefully you found it interesting too, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next lesson. Bye for now. Hey, kids. Milk rocks. That's what we're doing in this lesson. Hopefully we're going to make some solid items from milk and vinegar. Vinegar, anyway. So, um, we're going to need um, about 10 ml of full cream milk. Now, I say milk like that. Some people think that's weird. I know you say milk or something like that, but I don't know. I think it might be my Dutch heritage or something like that, but I say milk. 
Okay. Now that's straight out of the freezer. Out of the freezer. That's straight out, straight out of the fridge. And I've poured in a little bit too much. I'll be honest with you. So I might just pour some out. That's about right, I think. Yeah. About 10 mil. We need about 10 mil. Now that's straight out of the fridge. So the temperature I'm guessing now should be about six degrees Celsius thereabouts. Okay. Um, I think our fridge is maybe five degrees Celsius, but the moment I poured it into a beaker, it would have started warming up. Um, so we're at 12, 12, 11, 11 and a half. You know what? It's probably going to be about 11 degrees. All right, so about 11 degrees. Now, for this activity to work, we actually need to warm up the milk. We need to get it to about, I think the best temperature is about 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's not going to be difficult to get it to 35 degrees Celsius, so I'll just pop on my safety glasses, and I'd like a stirring rod. And let's whoop, light the candle. And okay, I think it's important that we sort of like stir it so that it's not just heated up in the bottom. I think we need to try and sort of, you know, mix it thoroughly so that we don't get like just a really hot a hot point that's what I think now it won't take too long to get to 35 degrees Celsius let's try that what do you think what do you think the temperature will be hmm now have you heard of the this little poem or something little miss Muffet sat on a cuffet eating a curds and whey Along came a spider. Well, I almost tipped that over. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet, Miss Tuffet, away. She was eating her curds and whey. Have you ever thought about what curds and whey are? I'm getting some serious fogging happening here on my glasses. Um, I might just give them a good old wipe. There we go. Curds and whey. Well, if you put a acid, I think that was about 22 degrees or something, by the way. If you put an acid with um, milk, uh, you can actually cause it to curdle. The, the solids uh, will clump together, forming curds. Forming curds. Have you ever got a little brother or a little baby sister and all they drink is milk? All right, let's say that all they're doing is drinking milk, and yet when they chuck, <laughs> they chuck up solids. How can that be when, if you're just drinking liquids, how can you chuck up a solid? Well, their stomach contains hydrochloric acid, and that hydrochloric acid is causing the um, milk to curdle. So now we're at about 34 degrees. Perfect. That's exactly what I want. And we'll need a second beaker. Okay, we'll need a second beaker from, you'll need it from Junior Chemistry Set 1. And we're going to put just some, just some vinegar. Okay, just some vinegar in that. That's probably a bit too much. So I'll tip out some of that. And I might just warm up the vinegar as well. Normally I just pour in cold vinegar. But normally I, I've never done this, I don't think I've ever done this with small such small amounts of liquid and so by pouring in a small amount of cold vinegar it might might cool it down just too much that's what i'm thinking all right so i'm about ready now i've got my i blow out my um candle i'm going to put the milk there and i can actually use the pipette and I'm going to squirt in a bit of vinegar and give it a mix. Let's see if any curdling happens. Will any curdling happen? I hope so. Oi! Oh yeah! It's happening! It's happening! Yeah! <laughs> I'm 
I'm going to add a bit more. Zoop. There we go. Ah, it looks exactly like baby vomit. That's exactly what it looks like now. Looks like chuck. That's what I used to call it when my little kids were growing up. Chuck. Okay, so I've got my curds, which are the solid part, and my whey, which is the liquid part. So I'm going to use my um, filter funnel, and I want a conical flask, because I'd like to try and separate the curds from the whey. And I'm going to get a... Uh, where's some filter paper? Hello, filter paper. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm actually, you know what I'm going to use? I'm going to use a bit of filter paper from a previous lesson. My lemon, <laughs> my lemon filter paper. Talking about lemon, I believe you can use lemon juice to, um, curd, you know, to curdle, curdle milk, or, and even citric acid. Remember I said it's the acids that will curdle it? Vinegar is an acid, ethanoic acid it's called. Um, citric acid, and of course lemon juice has got citric acid in it. I can actually see that the solids are settling. Can you see how the solids are settling there? The curds are settling and the whey is left behind. Now both the curds and the whey are food items. Okay, So let's little have a look at this. Look, chunk, cluck, 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 cluck. Oh, look at that. Look at that in the bottom of that beaker. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, so I'm sort of what we call um, decanting. Decanting the um, away from the curds. And here, you can see uh, the stuff that's left behind, the stuff that's left behind in the filter paper is called the residue, the residue, and the stuff that uh, drips out is called the filtrate, okay? And so I might even try and speed it up a little bit by, now sometimes we use tea towels to do this, or what's called, I think it's called muslin. Mm, not too sure what the name of the special cloth is, but they use it as a filter. There we go. Look, I'm squeezing out the way. And if I was using like um, equipment that wasn't scientific equipment, I could I could actually have a little bit of a drink of that and see what it tasted like. Okay, so now I can open it up, and I've got some of that uh, curds sitting there, right there. Now, the idea, the idea is that we actually get the curds, look, oops, sorry, we actually get the curds out and we shape them, right? Here we go. So if we give them a bit of a squeeze. Now, I, I think I've heard stories where they used to make buttons from these. Now, I've made little dice. I've made little dice now. I don't think I'm going to be able to make a little dice from this. It's because not very much. Typically, I used to make a, a lot bigger ones, but you know, I can certainly shape it into a little rock. See that? And this, the title of this lesson is Milk Rocks. So there we go. If we put this out into the sun, um, it will harden up. And isn't that interesting? Getting a solid from a liquid. There we go. Milk rocks. All right. Bye for now. I'll see you again soon. Bye. Hey kids. Did you know that around your house there's lots of substances that can be classified as acids or bases? Now another name for base is basically an alkali. Um, lemon juice. Sour, yeah? It's acidic. What about <laughs> well, obviously, citric acid is acidic. And of course, vinegar. Vinegar is an acid as well. Well, we're going to um, make a special liquid that will test whether something is acidic or 
virtually the opposite, which we'll call basic. Now, if it's neither acidic or basic, then it's going to be neutral. And so plain tap water is neutral. Um, so what are we going to need? You're going to need some red cabbage. And you don't need much. You don't need much red cabbage. And red cabbage actually lasts a long time in the fridge. I would say that this cabbage, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit, not that great, but it's literally been in my fridge for about six months. So, and you're not, not going to need much of this at all. So I've got a, a knife here, careful if you're using a knife because they can cut you, of course. And you're going to need, you know, some things like some lemon juice and vinegar and some bicarbonate of soda. Um, I've got some soap here. There's a few things, different things that you can test around the house. But first, we're going to make our testing solution. I'm um, going to need a beaker. And I'm going to thinly slice, thinly slice some um, cabbage. There we go. And I'm going to load my beaker with this cabbage. There we go, I'm really going to, <laughs> I don't normally put like this much cabbage in, but why not? I'm going to load it up today. I'm feeling generous. And I'll put some water in there. And I've, I'll get some safety glasses. Hello. Okay, found them. And let's get a little bit of heat happening. So, I'll light my match. Pop him under here. And get the wick burning. And I'm going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> I'm actually going to put the match in the wax as well. And now I've got a double wick. Now I'm burning lots of wax. So I'm getting a lot of heat very, very quickly. I, I don't really recommend that you do this, but this will certainly make the um, video, go, video go a lot quicker. Um, wow, there's a lot of heat there. In fact, I can even leave the match sitting there because I want to get my stirring rod and I might hold the beak with the tweezers. Okay, so if I hold the beaker with the tweezers like this and give it a bit of a jabby jabby like this, this will help. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get the colours. Oh, actually that, <laughs> that match is going crazy now. It's not really what I wanted. Ooh. Here we go. All right, let's just be happy with the normal speed. Sometimes it doesn't pay to be impatient, does it? And let's give it some nice mixy, 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 because that, by sort of giving it a bit of a mix, the colors will come out even faster. But heat, heat will certainly um, get those colors out because heat, heat speeds up the rate at which stuff dissolves. Why would heat speed up the rate at which something dissolves? Well, heat is the movement of particles. And as the particles get hotter, they move faster and they bump into each other with a greater force. And so when they bump into something, they can break, they can break things apart. And so you're sort of like breaking the walls of the the cell walls of the, the cabbage, and that's releasing the, the dye, and then the dye spreads throughout the liquid more quickly. So, yeah, heat, heat is certainly... Oh, and I can start to see a little bit of um, steam happening there. Can it be steam already? Hmm, and what colour? Oh, I'm seeing a... I'm seeing a nice purple juice, actually. Yep, I'm seeing a nice purple juice. Might just see what temperature that is, just out of interest. I really do like these thermometers. Nice digital thermometer. Put the probe in. Here we go. I think it's going to be 60 degrees Celsius, that's my guess. 
Uh, it's jumped up to 50, 56, 60, 62. I think I was quite close, but don't forget, it's, keep, it's still going up because the, um, the heat's on 65, 66. And don't forget, it's going to boil. It's going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius, 68. That's wonderful. It's all happening now, my my friends. And might give up one last. How many of you have tipped your beaker over <laughs> and had your liquid go everywhere? Have you ever accidentally got some water in your candle? Oh. Candles do not like water. Oh no. <laughs> Candles spit and don't light properly. Yeah. Candles and water and paraffin don't mix. I mean, I'd like to say they don't like each other, but it's not like they've got like personalities where they can like each other or not. So I don't really like using that terminology in science. Okay, I think that's good enough. So, I'm going to blow out the candle. And again, I, look, I really love the conical flask. So I'm going to use that. And I also like the funnel. Whose favorite piece of equipment is the funnel? And I'm going to use the tweezers and the stirring rod. And I'm going to pour the liquid down the stirring rod like this. The stirring rod is going to hold the solids back so that I only end up with the liquid. That, that is very satisfying. Look at that, extremely satisfying. It's a nice purple juice. Let's move that. And that is going to be our testing liquid. So how about I get my ice cube tray and pop test tube there, test tube one there, test tube two there. And I'm going to draw up some of that liquid. One, two. So I've got three colors that are basically identical. And what about if I get some citric acid? Ta-da! And I put it on a little bowl here. Not a bowl, a little plate. And set number one has actually got the little spoon in it. So let me get the little spoon out. Hmm. Push it on with my finger. And let's pop it in there like that. There we go. And now, I haven't shown you how to mix a test tube yet, but this is how you mix a test tube. Okay, this is how you stir it. You hold hold the test tube between two fingers and you go wiggle, 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 tap, 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 tap. See that? Tap, 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 tap. And that actually dissolves the... And let's have a look. Let's compare the two. Can you see that? What might be best is if I pop a white screen behind it. Look at that. See that? The red one is the citric acid. Now, what about the bicarb? What about the bicarb? Bicarb soda. What do you think will happen if we add bicarb soda? I'm just cleaning the plate so I don't have any citric acid contaminant. A bit of bicarb soda. Here we go. Got a nice lump. Okay. Put that 
lumping with my fingers. And mixy, 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 mixy. And look at that. <gasps> so, I've actually got a blue. So, there's the original in the middle. Citric acid is on my left, your right, and the bicarb, which is a base or an alkali, is on uh, your left or my right. Woo. And do you want to see something interesting? I've got an acid and a base. What will happen if I pour a little bit of the acid? Way! <laughs> I get bubbles. I get bubbles and a change of colour. <gasps> look, look. It's gone back to neutral. I've actually, I'm actually neutralising the bicarb with the citric acid. Hey, and those bubbles are actually bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? What about soap? What about soap? Let me tip that out. Do you think soap is um, alkali or acidic or neutral? It's a good question, isn't it? What do you think soap is? pH. pH is another term for how acidic or basic something is. And so I've got some soap. And I've got a knife, I'm just going to scrape a little bit of soap. There we go. That was actually a lot. And I'll pop, pop that soap into the test tube. I'm going to add a little bit of water. Like that. And I'm, I'm sort of going to dissolve it a bit by... But I'm also going to get my stirring rod and give it a... Don't push too hard with the stirring rod into a test tube or you'll, you'll smash straight through the bottom. There's no doubt about that. So I'm making... That's quite soapy water there. Okay. Soapy water. What do you think the colour change will be? I've got purple neutral and squirt that in. Look at that. That is very conclusive. That has gone blue. Soap is alkali. So interesting, isn't it? So interesting. Now, included in the, I'm, I'm making a mess here, included in the junior chemistry set two is, well, Phil, Fill the paper we've seen, but there's also this little green packet, okay, and it says pH on it. Now that pH doesn't refer to phone home. Now there's a famous movie. Your parents will know what the movie is I'm talking about. You probably won't. Phone home. Someone had to phone home. Hmm, I'd like to tell you. It's two letters the name of this creature, I'll tell you. It's E.T. E.T. Phone Home. Do you know what E.T. stands for? Extraterrestrial. It was a, I don't know, an extraterrestrial. Alien, an alien. Quite a funny little alien um, that landed on planet Earth and needed to get back home. I don't know, control the phone system or something. Needed to phone home to get help. I can't quite remember. But it was a good show. A good movie. E.T. Phone Home. Good family movie. Probably a book too, but I think the movie became came before the book. Okay, so I'm putting a little bit of water. Putting a little bit of water into the beaker. And I'm going to need fire. Now this pH paper... This pH paper, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it there, and it's used to determine. It's 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 actually got like purple cabbage is one type of indicator. 
Purple cabbage is one type of indicator. Well, pH paper, this universal pH paper has actually got quite a lot of different types of chemicals. Um, and so it actually has a range of colours, quite a range of colours. So it's also called universal indicator. Universal indicator. Now, it's not... They haven't designed it. They haven't designed it to do what I'm doing. They've actually designed it for to actually dip it into... Um, dip it into light liquids and, and the paper will change colour. But I think it works very, very well. Okay, I think it works very, very well if you actually boil the chemicals out. Okay, so if you actually boil the chemicals out, it actually works really well. Now you have to make sure you've got clean equipment here. Okay, clean equipment. Because it's easy to contaminate your equipment with, um, you know, soaps and chemicals and that sort of stuff. So keep the equipment clean. And the beauty is, while I'm cleaning my equipment, the um, that universal indicator is dissolving its its colours into the water. So I'm doing two jobs at once, three jobs actually. I'm boiling the water, heating the water. I'm cleaning my equipment. And what's the third job? I'm talking to you. Yay! That's why filming these videos is actually quite exhausting, believe it or not. I get, I actually get very, very tired filming these videos. You might think, but all you're doing is sitting there, Jacob. It's true, but my mind is going fast. All right, it's like playing chess. I'm thinking a few moves ahead, so that, um, so that the lesson continues, and hopefully there's a small amount of interest in the in the lesson. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and by not having to sit here, if I don't, if I sit here and go, um, ooh, e, well, then I've got to do a lot of editing after the video. But if I keep things moving and keep talking and there's not too much empty time, then in actual fact, I can edit these videos very, very quickly. So... And you're probably saying, yeah, we can tell, Jacob. <laughs> no need to be rude, okay? There's no need to be rude. I'll be rude about myself. You don't have to make comments. All right. So this is about right now. Here we go. Give it a good old mix, because I can see that the liquid, the water, has gone a dark yellow. So I'm going to blow that out. And uh, where's my funnel? And I'm going to tip that in there like that. There we go. I know I don't come across like a very smart person, but um, I actually thought this was really quite smart, sending out the universal indicator as a paper form for you to make a liquid, because it's actually very difficult for companies to send out liquids. Uh, there's lots of rules you need to follow, but that was very straightforward. So, all right, let me put some of that liquid into each of the test tubes and we'll get some citric acid. You know what? I might, I might even just like tip the citric acid straight in. What do you think? Tip, 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 tip. Wait, and straight away instantaneously well at first i saw it go yellow and now now it's sort of gone like a um an orangey red color okay some a dramatic change straight away look at that orangey red and then the idea is that you get that little booklet right I'll just take off my glasses so i can see properly and you compare the color with the colour on the um, booklet. Excuse me. Very itchy nose there. And it says the orangey colour is 3. So it's got a pH of 3. Okay, pH of 3. The green, green is pH of 7, which is neutral. Okay, P green is a pH of 7, which is neutral. And so I'll get a little bit of bicarb soda. A little bit, you watch a whole giant chunk fall. 
before we have. Oop, there we go. And let's see what color this changes. Oop, whoa, instant. Okay, it's gone sort of a greeny blue. Okay, so again, I take my paper and I go, okay, I think that's got a pH of 11. So if the number's higher than, well, actually, it's probably closer to 10. Yeah, I'd say it's in between 9 and 10. Um, if the pH is greater than 7, then it's alkali. If it's less than 7, then it's acidic. So now we've done um, we've done cabbage. We've used the paper, and you can test a whole range of substances around your house. So you could try some dishwashing liquid. You could try some deter underarm deodorant if you have any. Whoa! Or if your mum almost tipped the whole table then. Um, or your mum or dad might have some, or your older brother might have some deodorant. You could try some deodorant. Shampoo. Um, tartaric, you know, tartaric acid out of the cooking cupboard. Um, yeah. yeah. Just don't try anything like super, super caustic. Don't try like um, oven cleaner. That's not a good idea because it's too dangerous. Okay, that's too dangerous. So what's next? What's next? Well, um, I went and picked a few flowers. And what's next is some flowers, okay, that you might find around your garden or in somebody else's garden, actually work as acid base indicators. Now, I've got these yellow ones here that are closing up. Now, this plant here is actually quite an unusual plant because it's very sappy, okay? Um, the When you pick it, it's got white sap, and I know that sap is actually quite, quite caustic. So I don't think I've ever tried these flowers to see whether they work as acid base indicators. So we're sort of going to boil it just like we did um, the cabbage, all right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to boil it up just like we did the cabbage. Let me kick that out. And we're going to see if any colors come out. Now, it might not appear that any color comes out. Now that doesn't mean That colour hasn't come out, just might mean it's colourless. But it still might change colour with an acid or a base. So don't be too quick to say it's not working. Okay, don't be too quick to say it's not working. Having said that, not all flowers act as acid base indicators. So I'll I'll say that now. Okay, so not all flowers act as acid base indicators, but Certainly some do. And what I've actually found quite surprising over the year is typically it's the plain white flowers that actually work quite well. You might think that, oh, I'll go get a flower that's got really bright colours. Yeah, you might get a nice colourful solution, um, but you it won't typically work as an acid base indicator. Sometimes I've found the colourless solutions are the ones that actually change colors the best so it's about experimenting okay almost feels like I'm making a little bit of a potion here <laughs> all right that's getting warm I can feel it that's for sure have any colors come out I don't know I'll get my funnel again and decant there we go and again look this is colorless okay this is color so is it, has it, is it a failure? I don't know yet. Might be, might not be. Pop that in there. One there. It's clear and colourless. It's a clear and colourless solution, that's for sure. And let's get a little bit of citric acid and let's see if anything happens. And no change of colour. All right. What about bicarb? There's a bit of bicarb left here. 
and nope. So I can say that those yellow sappy flowers are bum bum. I'm hoping that you might have more success than I. Okay, a little bit disappointing to finish a lesson like that, but you know, I'd call that a null result. And you might think, what a waste of time. But no, it's not a waste of time because I know not to use those flowers again to make an acid base indicator because they don't work. So null results can be quite helpful. And also, it's not much fun me just sitting here, you know, making it all happen and the different color changes. It's more exciting for you to actually do it yourself and experience the color changes. Okay, anyway, well, that's it for this lesson. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey, hey, hey. Um, how you going, kids? Um, today we're going to be looking at all things sherbet. Now, have you ever had sherbet before? Um, comes as like whiz fizz. Uh, sometimes it's inside lollies. But plainest, simplest sherbet is this white powder that when you put it into your mouth, it's nice and sweet, but it's also sour, but more importantly, it fizzes up. And it's got three key ingredients. Sugar for the sweetness, citric acid for the sourness, and a bit of bicarbonate of soda. Now, bicarbonate of soda, we're going to find out later, tastes terrible. But when water from the saliva in your mouth reacts with the citric acid in the bicarb soda, it causes bubbles of carbon dioxide gas, which causes the sherbet to froth up and fizz up in your mouth. So we're going to look at the three key ingredients, and then we're going to be making some sherbet ourselves. So that sounds interesting, doesn't it? So I've just got some, you're going to need, of course, some sugar, um, some citric acid and some bicarb. And I've got a little, just a teaspoon here and a little bit of a bowl and we'll see how we go. So first up, let's have a look at the sugar. Hmm. All right, so this sugar is white. Okay, the sugar is white and looks like it's made up of tiny little cubes, tiny little cubes and they're crystals. Okay, they're crystals of sugar. And it's, you know, I'd, I'd call it, I'd describe it as a white, white crystalline solid. Okay, a white crystalline solid. And if I taste it, it tastes sweet. I like it, I like sugar a lot. Mm. And in fact, if I, I can actually crunch the crystals between my teeth and they're a little bit crunchy as well. Mm. Now you can use icing sugar for sherbet, but I'm just going to use like um, white sugar. Now you might notice that I've got a, um, a microscope set up here and a microscope helps us um, extend our sight or our, our sense of sight. Uh, it helps us observe small things by making them appear a lot bigger. And at the top of it, I've got a camera and the camera is going to my computer and I'm recording this and so we'll be able to, see, well, you'll be able to see um, what the sugar crystals look like when we put them under the microscope. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to put some sugar crystals on this piece of glass. This is called a glass slide, okay? And we'll pop them under the microscope and we'll see if we can get a, some images forming here. And straight away we can actually see some huge crystals. I'm going to move the slide around. Okay, move the slide around so, and maybe we can find some individual ones. So like the magnification of these is actually really huge. So it's actually hard to see one crystal in its entirety entirety because they are actually so big so i'm trying to find a small little one there's two 
there's two sort of next to each other and you can see there the sharp corners on them and you can see that they're like cuboid uh, cubes. Oh, that, that looked like a crystal within a crystal. Look at that. Interesting. Let's head over here. What else do we have? Now I'm on the lowest power magnification. If I was on the highest power magnification, we wouldn't be able to see the outside structure of these um, sugar cubes. But I'm hoping that you can see that they've got a very regular shape. Some of, the, some of them are a little bit like crushed up, okay, without a doubt. But look at that. Isn't that very, very interesting? All right, I'll just pack this away now. All right. So that's packed away. Now I've got a little bit of a demonstration for you. Now you know things are serious when I pull out rubber gloves because I don't use gloves particularly often. But I'm going to actually be handling um, a very concentrated and quite dangerous acid called sulfuric acid. Now the formula for sulfuric acid is H2SO4. H2, the H stands for hydrogen, the S stands for sulfur, and the O stands for oxygen. And the numbers mean how many atoms of each of them there are, so H2SO4. I'm also going to put on my glasses, and I'm going to get a small beaker, and I'm going to put salt, not salt, sugar in the beaker, of course. So, put some sugar in the beaker, and I will need to give it a little bit of a, there's a little bit of water in that beaker, which is okay, because I actually don't mind a little tiny bit of water um, with this sugar, actually. And I'm just going to push the sugar down, and there we go. Now, I've got what we call concentrated sulfuric acid. And I'll undo the lid. Now, notice I've got my glasses and my gloves on. And I'm going to pour some the sulfuric acid with the sugar. There we go. And I'll put the lid on straight away. Now, sulfuric acid has a very high affinity for water. Okay, it absorbs water. Now, there's not much water that was in that beaker, but sugar has got the formula C6H12O6. And you might know the formula for water being H2O. So in actual fact, there's lots of hydrogen and oxygen trapped in sugar, I guess. Hmm. And the sulfuric acid is actually going to take that hydrogen and oxygen from the sugar and it's going to leave behind just the carbon. And carbon, we've found, is in the form of graphite or in the form of soot, is actually black. And you can actually see that that is actually going black because of the carbon. Now, this is an exothermic reaction, and that is that it's going to produce some heat. And I'm hoping that that heat will then do something very interesting. Let's see if I can get the reaction to go by actually heating it up a little bit. Now, this is definitely not something a kid should be doing. Notice I'm a trained science teacher and I've got the safety equipment on and I'm hoping that I can get this reaction to proceed. So that you can see it happen. Okay, I 
think this might happen. Once it actually starts going, I'm pretty sure I can actually then turn it off. I can blow the flame out. Okay, so I've turned off the heat. The heat is turned off, and this is proceeding. This is proceeding by itself. Okay, there's no longer any heat. This exothermic reaction of the um, sulfuric acid is reacting with the sugar. Look at that. The sulfuric acid is drawing. It's drawing all of the, the water out of the sugar, leaving behind just carbon. Oh, and you can see the smoke. It smells... Mmm, smells like burnt sugar. Isn't that interesting? Ha! Huh. And if I poke this, this is actually solid. Okay, this is actually solid. Look at that. I can pick it up like that. <laughs> Woo! Very interesting. Very interesting. But what you can do is we can heat a little bit of sugar in a steel pan. So if you take out your plastic container, oh, that steel pan's missing. Oh, that's because I used it for something else and I didn't put it back. So if you take out your steel pan, and the steel is better to use than the aluminium pan, and if we pop that there and put a little bit of sugar in it okay put a little bit of sugar in it then i can actually put it on the heat and if i get my stirring rod like this and if you heat it up gently make sure you're wearing your um goggles you'll see that the sugar starts turning into looks like a liquid a sticky liquid well it's turning it it's going from a solid to a liquid which is a reversible change and it happens at a particular temperature and that particular temperature is the melting point Okay, that particular temperature is the melting point. Now, once it has melted, once it has melted, the temperature of that liquid will heat up. Okay, it will heat up. Now, something like water, if you heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius, it will start to boil and turn into a gas. However, this liquid sugar rather than turning into a gas, it will actually react with the oxygen in the air before that, and it will actually burn. And that's what's happening now. It's starting to bubble, and it's starting to burn. Now, you might need to have some a bit of a ventilated area to do this, okay? Open up some windows or something, and don't overdo it. But you're actually removing the water and again, we're going to be left with um, carbon. That's why it's actually going black. And that's an irreversible change. So sugar does have a melting point, but we don't actually reach the boiling point because it actually combusts with the oxygen first. There you go. Now the melting point of sugar is about 185 degrees Celsius. But the boiling point is 820 degrees Celsius. And that liquid sugar will actually, as I've said, combust before it gets to 820. All right. So that's sugar. Okay. That's sugar. Now you can just soak that in water and the overnight, and that should clean up. Not a problem. So now... 
let's talk let's talk about bicarb soda so bicarb soda here we go i might tip out my sugar for now and put some bicarb soda in here and bicarb soda is a white powder uh, it doesn't seem to have the same crystalline structure as the sugar probably because it's been ground up now if I put a little bit on the back of my hand and just a little tiny bit okay you can taste it mm. yeah taste terrible first tastes very salty and then it tastes a little bit bitter doesn't taste very nice at all um, not a huge fan of bicarb soda. Ugh, yuck, that's disgusting. But, um, and the formula for bicarb soda is um, Na2HCO3, sodium hydrogen carbonate. And so bicarbonate of soda contains sodium atoms, hydrogen atoms, carbon atoms, and oxygen atoms. Very, very interesting. But one of my favorite chemicals is citric acid. And citric acid is a white crystalline solid. The crystals seem to be a little bit smaller than sugar. I bet if I looked under them at the microscope, they'd look like, like broken down crystals. And if I was to taste that, hmm, very sour. Super sour, but I like it. I like that sourness. That's the that sour they put on many lollies these days. Like the sour, all the sour lollies are just coated in citric acid. Ah, absolutely delicious. <laughs> I'll put it as very sour. And so, if we put these three chemicals together, then we can actually make some sherbet. So we should try and do this a little bit scientifically. And we'll start off with one level spoon of, start off with one level spoon of sugar. Okay, so if I go tap, 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 I'm getting a level spoon of sugar and I'll put that into a little bowl. And then I'm going to do half a spoon of citric acid. Okay, so we're going to, do, or we, you are going to do a little experiment. Okay, what is the best, the best recipe for sherbet? And so we have to try different um, quantities. And so I've done one sugar, half citric, and half bicarb. And I'm going to then mix them together. Mixy, 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 mixy. Now you could use a mortar and pestle actually grind these together. Okay, you can use a mortar and pestle to grind these together. And once it's all well mixed, we've got a nice mixture of citric, one spoon of sugar, half a spoon of bicarb and half a spoon of citric acid. Then you can put it on the back of your hand and mm, that fizzed up really quickly. Very sour, quite nice actually. Gonna do it again. I did get the, the hit of bicarb back there though. I think maybe I've got a bit too much citric and a bit too much bicarb. Now I'm not going to go and try lots of different ratios, that's up to you to do. But if I was to do another um, trial, I'd probably do one spoon of sugar and a quarter spoon of citric and a quarter spoon of bicarb. That would be... Oh, that was sour. My next trial. So the chemical reaction is citric acid plus the bicarbonate yeah, of soda forms water, um, carbon dioxide, that's the froth, and a salt, and a salt. 
And it's actually a neutralization acid, uh, neutralization reaction, where the acid and the base react together to form water, carbon dioxide, and a salt. Now, you can even add some jelly crystals to see if you can even make a, a nicer confectionery. And you could even, um, in a pan, maybe even um, make some toffee from sugar and perhaps even fold into it some, some citric acid and maybe even, once it's cooled down a little bit, some bicarb soda so that it becomes like a, a bit of a sherbet lolly or something like that. Just um, remember though, when you're heating sugar, the temperatures can get very high and so you definitely need to have an adult around. But making toffee is actually very, very interesting and very scientific. Anyway, well, that's it on uh, this lesson on sherbet. Big lesson. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey, kids. In this lesson, we're going to actually try and grow some crystals. Now, salt is a crystal. In fact, sugar's a crystal too. Um, some other things that form crystals are like copper sulfate. But in the um, bag that came with the junior chemistry set too is something called alum. And alum is um, potassium aluminium sulfate and it's very good for growing crystals. So when you remove the lid, twist it gently so that you don't get all the chemicals um, coming out. And what we're going to try and do is make a concentrated solution, a concentrated solution. So I've got a clean beaker and I'm going to tap some of the alum in there. Um, I might put in about a fifth, a fifth of the little container, and then make sure you put the lid straight back on so that you don't lose any. And I'm only going to add a little tiny bit of water. Okay, just a little bit of water. I've got a stirring rod, and I'm going to stir that up. Now, at the moment, it's just a little bit of a slurry. Okay. And I can sort of see that it's starting to dissolve. So I'm going to add a little bit more. Okay. And I'll, I want to dissolve this alum in a very small amount of water. That's the, that's the key. Because I want to have what's called a very saturated, okay, a very saturated or a saturated solution. That is a a solution which actually won't dissolve too much more. Now, if you increase the temperature of the water, it will actually dissolve more, and I might even be able to make what's called a super saturated solution. So I'm actually going to warm that up a little bit. So let's warm this up a little bit, uh, using, of course, our little burners. And let's get the candle going. there and let's just get a little bit of warmth because that by heating the water will be able to dissolve a little bit more and it, and it will dissolve more quickly okay so not only will it dissolve more it will actually dissolve more quickly so mixy 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 mixing also speeds up the rate of dissolving as well. So it's a good bit of stirring. Now don't bang the don't bang the beaker because otherwise you might end up actually just wrecking. Uh, you put your glass rod straight through the bottom of the beaker and that's not very good either is it? Okay. How are we going there? Yeah I'm getting there. That's for sure. I'm getting there. Might just let that sit there just for a moment. I can see some steam coming off it, so I'll pop that there. And I'm going to get the next step ready. And the next step is to grow the crystals, we have to evaporate the
the liquid. Now we can do that slowly or quickly and we're actually going to try and do it fairly quickly. Now I've put about oh, two mil of water into that beaker there, so not a lot of water. And I really need to have it sort of um, quite level. There we go, that's quite good. And oh, I'm getting some smoke coming off that. I'm not too sure. It definitely can't be uh, boiling already. I think there's a little bit of wax on it. That's okay. And I'm going to need my steel pan. So where did I put my steel pan? Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Hello, steel pan. Um, my, my equipment's starting to get a little bit messy. Ah, <laughs> steel pan's right in front of me. Make sure it's clean. This one's got a little bit of the sugar from the previous lesson. So give it a little bit of, do a little bit of washing up. There we go. And rather than heating this up directly, I'm actually going to put the pan on top of the beaker. See that? Put the pan on top of the beaker and I've got my pipette. Let's have a little look here. Yeah, I'm, there's there's some undissolved alum down here, which means I've actually got a fairly concentrated solution above it. So I don't want to draw up the undissolved stuff. I just want to dissolve, uh, draw up the solution and I'm going to put that solution in the steel pan there we go now what's happening here really want to try and get that as level as possible and so We've got some water boiling in the beaker. So it's almost reached 100 degrees Celsius. That's quite um, impressive, that. Every time I see some water boiling in a beaker, I'm amazed. Like, that is, that is phenomenal. Now, that's, that's definitely boiling now. And so the steam will go up. And that hot steam, it's going to gently heat, gently heat the steel pan. Okay, gently heat the steel pan. So we're going to very, and you know what I could actually do? You know what I could actually do? If you want to grow a plant, you start with a little seed. Sometimes if you want to grow a crystal, you start with a little seed crystal for the other crystals to grow on. So I might actually get one of these small little crystals, okay? Just a tiny bit. Because I want to give a place for the crystals to start forming on. So I'm actually going to tip tip some crystals into that beak into that pan. Okay, like that. And then I'm going to Put the overhead camera on and we'll leave it be for a bit okay
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the regular crystals. So I've got my glass here. Well, I'm going to look at what the alum look like. Okay. Let's pop the alum, a little bit of alum on the watch glass. Tap, tap, tap. under and I need to focus it and that is looks like three little crystals of alum There's another little bunch of crystals of them there's some more Oh, that is a nice square one there. I should say cube. I mean, these look like... Don't forget, the crystals are actually three-dimensional. Also, the alum has been crushed. Crushed up, and so you get broken bits of crystal, basically. But it looks like it forms... Alum forms like a cube or... Cube or... Cube, cube, cube type of crystal. Okay, so the question now is, what does, what does the substance that we've been evaporating look like? What's this one look like? Now, scrape it. Hmm. Okay, I'll scrape some onto the other side of the watch glass and let's go across. And see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Certainly haven't got the, it's almost like broken sheets of glass. Wow. Science is very, very fascinating. Whoa, look at that. That almost looked like a sheet of glass or something like that. Okay, conclusive, I don't think I've been able to grow crystals, in fact, it seems like I've taken some small crystals and I've, evap I've dissolved them, evaporated them, and I've changed them into even smaller crystals. <laughs> oh well, that's okay. Um, let's pop this here, and think of a other way. To form some crystals. So, next step. Next step. Put on glasses. And dissolve some more alum. Okay, dissolve some more alum. Okay. Whoa, that was a lot. That was a lot. And there we go, about five mil. Give it a good dissolve. And what we'd like to do now is 
is heat that up and dissolve it. Now let me just get my video there. Good. So by heating it up, we're going to be dissolving it and getting it super saturated. But I also want to try and evaporate some of that water. Okay. I want to evaporate some of that water. So probably might be good to like sort of like boil it for five to ten minutes, something like that. And while that's happening, set up the next step. Okay. And now the next step is to get the little ice cube tray and a clean beat a clean test tube and another clean test tube like this and some string now I had some string somewhere where did I put that string there we go we'll get the string and we're going to be putting this concentrated solution into the test tube and I'm going to dangle the string in but I don't want the string to fall in so I'm going to now What's the best string to use? Oh. Fibrous, fibrous string. Okay, string that's got fiber. That would be the best string. Like cotton. I guess it can be all part of the. Um... Let's go like that. That's a little bit too long, so let me just snip it a bit shorter. I've got some better scissors here. Like this. And pop him there like that. You sort of want that to dangle just right down vertically into the middle of the test tube. Um, Perfect. Could even be a little bit longer. Could be a little bit longer. Now, have you ever heard of rock candy? Rock candy. It's made from sugar. And I've got the recipe for making the rock candy uh, in the workbook. And you'll need adult supervision. But essentially, you're making sugar crystals. So you'll need a pan and a stove. That's why you need adult supervision. And a glass of water and a glass of sugar. Now you put the water into the pan and you heat it up. Okay, you heat it up. And then you pour in the sugar. And then you have to keep stirring it up until all the sugar is dissolved. Now, sometimes it's then best to actually keep heating it and evaporating it to get a nice, really concentrated um, solution. Then you pour it into a glass jar, like a clean jam jar, jam jar that's been cleaned, or even a, just a normal drinking glass. And you suspend into it a kebab stick, okay, a timber kebab stick. And you might get a clothes peg, like a normal size clothes peg, to hold the kebab stick so that the kebab stick is sitting a bit like that into the glass. Now, but though prior to putting in the kebab stick, you actually dip the kebab stick in some water and then you coat it with some sugar crystals because they're going to act as the seed. Okay, they're going to act as the seed for the, the rock candy. And then once you've got your concentrated sugar solution with your kebab stick um, hanging in, inside it, then put it, you know, somewhere quiet, somewhere it won't be desert, uh, disturbed, maybe put a tea towel over it and leave it there for a few days. And hopefully when you come back, 
crystals of sugar have formed on the kebab stick. And you could even try some food colouring in the water, and you could even try some, uh, like some essences. Like, for example, you could try some lemon essence in there, and then your um, your rock candy might might taste of lemon, you know? So, so I don't, I'm not going to sit here and uh, wait for this to fully um, sort of, I really want it to boil and evaporate down a bit. Now, what I can do, if I can pour, you, there we go, the alum solution into there, and I will pop that there, and then that string can dangle in there. And we might leave that, we can leave that for a couple of days um, and see whether the alum crystals grow on there. Okay, so there we go. That's it for this lesson. Thanks for joining me and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone. Have you ever been down to the beach on a hot day and you brought some cold drinks and pretty soon they get hot and they're not very nice? Well, you should have brought an esky along because an esky will help keep your cold drinks cold by stopping the heat from going in there. And it uses something called insulation. There's some insulation in the walls of this esky that stop the heat transfer. What about, have you ever been down to the snow and you're freezing cold? That's because you don't have enough insulation. You need to wear a jacket. And I've been down, down to Tasmania and lots of kids wear these puffer jackets. In fact, I called it Land of the Puffer when I was down there last time. And um, they use, um, I think, uh, goose down, which is the very light feathers, and air pockets to trap uh, the heat, to stop heat from traveling um, from your body out to the outside. So in today's lesson, we're going to be testing um, some different forms of insulation and seeing how effective it is. So for today, you'll um, need your uh, thermometer from chemistry set number one. You'll need a stopwatch and you can use your mobile phone or you can use a proper stopwatch. Um, totally up to you. You'll need some beakers from junior chemistry set one. Okay, so you'll need ants from Junior Chemistry Set 2. So you'll need a couple of beakers. And you're also going to need... I'm just doing my washing up again. <laughs> I like washing up. Um, you're also going to need some sticky tape and some things to test so your insulation with. So you could try... I'm going to try bubble wrap and I'm going to try normal paper. Okay? So first things first, we need some hot water. We need some hot water. Now, I've got some hot water in here to start with, but I actually need to get it um, boiling. So I'm going to put on my safety glasses and I'm going to boil some water. And remember, um, now I, I'm not allowed to give first aid uh, advice, but <laughs> I'm going to. If you do get burnt, um, Make sure you run your burn under cold water, okay? Cold water and seek some medical advice, okay? Some medical help. So I'm going to get 10 ml of water, or a beaker of, beaker of water like that, and pop him there. And now this, <laughs> this was boiled about a few minutes ago in a kettle, and I can tell you it's cooled down quite rapidly. Now, why has it cooled down quite rapidly? Well, for a few things, a few reasons. There's no insulation. There's no insulation. And metal is a good conductor of heat. So in actual fact, that metal will get hot and will actually conduct the heat to the air around it. 
So the temperature of the water is actually a little bit higher than I thought it was. It's actually 68 degrees. Um, so that's not too bad at all. But <clears throat> right now, excuse me, the, um, this beaker of water is going to be getting hot fairly quickly. So one of the more dangerous things in science are beaker fulls of boiling water or hot water. So just keep that in mind. You don't really want to bump this and you can even like sit a little bit of away, away from it um, to stay safe. And we're going to, to actually see how effective the insulation is. The strange thing is you actually have to find out uh, what happens when you don't use any insulation at all. So there's a part of an experiment where you actually have to, it's called the control. It's called the control. And it's what happens if you don't do anything, you know? <laughs> and so we're not going to put any insulation on a beaker and we're going to see what happens when you don't do anything. And that one's called the control. So I've got my um, worksheet here and I'm going to be doing uh, the temperature of the control. I'll need a pen and you'll be able to see this on the overhead, not a problem at all. And this will be getting hot. This is probably going to be, no, I'm going to guess 80 degrees or something like that at the moment. Okay, 67, 73, 76, 78, and 80. Okay, well, I want a hundred. I want a hundred now. One reason why it takes some time to heat up is that as it heats up, it cools down. Why does it cool down? Well, there's there's not much insulation around this, is there? Now, I guess the glass glass is not a great conductor, and so the glass actually prevents. Well, it's. It, there is heat loss, there is heat loss, but it's probably not a huge lot of heat loss from the sides, but from the top, from the top there's probably heat loss. Um, so, yeah, we just have to wait for the, the water to heat up. Okay, so there we go, that's boiling now. So that will be 100 degrees Celsius, I don't even need to measure it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to Pour it into that beaker and then start the timer straight away. And so I have to record the temperature at zero. Now the temperature at zero is once that water's poured in. Okay, so I'm ready to go. Just need the tweezers. Where did I put them? Um, tweezers, tweezers, tweezers. Are they on the table? There they are. Okay, here we go. And ready, set, action. Get all that water in. I'll just blow that out. And the temperature says 84.3, 85.8, 86.3. I'm just waiting for it to reach its maximum time. And I'm going to put that there so that you can see that. 86.5, the moment it reaches maximum, that's when I'm going to start the timer. There we go, it's reached it. So 86.6, 86.6, and it's on its way down. Coming up to 30 seconds, it's 82 point, hmm, just jumped, I'm going to put 82. And in fact, I'm going to round the numbers as well. Okay, I'm going to round the numbers. And in five, four, Three, two, one, seventy nine, and 
five, four, three, two, one. It's 76. So far it's it lost like five degrees in the first 30 seconds and now it's sort of losing a consistent three degrees. That's quite interesting. It sort of jumped down quickly and now it's not losing as much heat. Okay, and in five, four, three, two, one, 73. It's lost another three degrees. Five, four, three, two, one, seventy one. Ah, interestingly, only just went down two degrees. Interestingly, Five, four, three, two, one, sixty nine degrees. So the last two times it's only lost two degrees. That confirms what I know. Uh, it's called Newton's law of cooling, and that is that the hotter an item is, the faster it cools. The hotter an item is, the faster it cools. So now that it's cooling down, its rate of cooling is reducing. Okay, 67 degrees. Until eventually it will reach the same temperature as room temperature and then it won't change temperature. Heat flows from higher temperatures to lower temperatures by itself. Five, four, three, two, one, sixty-five. What do you think? Do you think the next one will only have gone down one degree? Hmm. I think so. Oh, let's find out. I think so. With rounding, oh, it's at sixty-four now. Oh no, it will be. It will. B a 63. 3, 2, 1. Yep, 63.3, so 63. I'm going to bet for the last uh, reading at 5 minutes, I'm going to be writing down 62. That's what I bet. I'm sure of it. Sure of it. Come on. Come on. Don't call me a liar. Yeah, it will be. Five, four, three, two, one, sixty-one point seven is sixty-two rounded. Okay, so I'm actually going to graph that. Okay, I'm actually going to graph that. While I'm graphing that, I might actually get the temperature up to boiling. Okay, so I might just put that there and just get that temperature back up ready for the next experiment that way we don't have to wait around too long so this is going to be what's called a line graph and so we're going to put temperature and insulation we always have a title on our line graphs now what changed Actually, time. Time changed. So I'm going to put time in minutes down here. And we started off at zero. And we're, gonna, we're going to go up by half a minute. So half a minute, one minute. One and a half, two minutes. Two and a half, three minutes. Three and a half, four minutes. Four and a half, five minutes. And notice that I've labelled the lines. 
We also had a maximum of temperature of 87, so I'm actually going to go up by tens, because I know that there's 10 lines. And so can you see how I'm labeling the lines? 70, 80, 90, 100, and this is the temperature. There we go. In degrees Celsius. So our first value was 87. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, 87 at zero. So 87 is 85, 86, 87. So I'm going to put a cross there. At time half a minute was 82, which is about there. At time one, it was 79, about there. Time one and a half, it was 76. It's a little bit more than a half. Time two is 73. It's about there. Time two and a half is 71. There. Time three is 69, which is just there. Then three and a half is 67. And four is 65 is the halfway point and four and a half is 63 it's about well that should be the half that should be a bit higher 63 and this one's 62 and so I can actually draw a, a line of best fit it's actually a bit of a curve that's a bit of a curve beautiful and that's our control Okay, that's our control. So I can actually label it as C for control. Now, we want to do one with some insulation. Yeah, so let me pop that there. And we'll get a beaker. Oi! And how about we try with some bubble wrap? Okay, try with some bubble wrap. That's why I've got some sticky tape. And some scissors. This. And well, if I have it the same width, now be careful with scissors, of course, scissors are, well, sh scissors should be sharp. They're not always sharp, are they? Sometimes they're, sometimes they're blunt, depending on what you've been cutting with them for and the quality of the scissors. There we go. Ah, that's better. And let's let's wrap it like this. Okay. Wrap it around a few times. And that's what I've got the sticky tape for. Like that. Like that. And then I might even make a little um, base for it to sit on. A little insulation on the base. Put that there. That's nice. Over, go over, and hey, 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 I like it. And I'm going to make a little lid for it as well. There we go. So I'm going to pop a little lid on it like that. Good. So I'm ready for the next experiment. Ready for the next experiment. That's boiling. Okay, we need the stopwatch. Need the thermometer. Put the thermometer here. Put the stopwatch here. Now remember we started at 86.6. Well, I'm going to start it at the same temperature. Okay, you watch. You watch. Pop that there. And pour in all that water. Blow out my candle. Pop the little house, the little lid on it. 
might just put a, a weight on it so that it stays safe. And let's have a look. See how the temperature is going up? Hopefully we'll get to 86.6. Please keep going up. Keep going. I don't think it will. 85.6. Okay, well, we have to start at 85.6. We st ah, There's a little bit of a pain. I'm not too sure why. Why did it not go up as high? Hmm, not happy about that. But this is the bubble wrap. So I'm going to call that bubble wrap here. And 85.6 and we're at, going to be at 30 seconds. So four, three, two, one, boom, 83. Well, 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 we've already got some interesting results, don't we? Because have a look at this. The control started at 86.6 and dropped 4.4 degrees Celsius in the first 30 seconds. This one started at a degree lower, but has only dropped 2.6 degrees. So in five, four, three, two, one, it's 82. It's three degrees higher temperature. So the we can see straight away that the bubble wrap is uh, providing some type of insulation. So <laughs> it's already conclusive. It's already conclusive. Sometimes it doesn't take long to get some conclusive results. And in five, four, three, two, one, it's 80 degrees. Four degrees higher. Ha! Huh. This is good, isn't it? This is very interesting. This is good learning here. And in five, four, three, no, that was a bit premature, sorry. <laughs> four, three, two, one, it's 79 degrees. Okay, four to, oh, six, six degrees higher. I only dropped one degree. Wow. Huh. In four, three, two, one, seventy seven point six, which is actually seventy eight rounded up. Five, four, three, two, one, seventy six degrees. It appeared to have a drop of two degrees, but that's a little bit to do with rounding, so not totally fair. I'm pretty sure the next one will be a seventy five result. It will be hundred percent. Hundred percent will be a seventy five, which is eight degrees hotter than the um control and in three two one seventy five yep thought so again still eight degrees higher Five, four, three, two, one. It's seventy four. Three, two, one, seventy three, and I 
the final value is going to be 72, which is a full 10 degrees hotter. Yep, definitely. Almost don't even need to wait. I know that it will round up to 72. I might as well. Might as well, eh? And in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Seventy-two, fascinating, hey? Woo! All right, so let's just tip that water back, and just need to top it back up to the ten mil mark. There we go. And then I'm going to graph it. Okay, so I'm going to use a black pen for the bubble wrap. So at at zero degrees, it was 85.6, which is there. Then at half a minute, it was 83, which is here. Then one minute, 82. One and a half minutes, 80. Two minutes, 79. Two and a half minutes, 78. Three minutes, 70. Three minutes, 76, which is here. Three and a half, 75. And four minutes, 74. Here, four and a half minutes, 73. And five minutes, 72. That's the bubble wrap. There we go. And what? That's a significant difference, isn't it? There we go. And so we can even draw the insulated beaker, the first one. There's the side wall of the beaker. And then we can draw our bubble wrap all over it like this. Bubble wrap, bubble wrap, bubble wrap, bubble wrap, bubble wrap, bubble wrap, bubble wrap on the bottom, bubble wrap on the top, bubble wrap all over the sides. Hey, <laughs> lots of bubble wrap. Okay, so the next one we're going to do is paper. Okay, insulated paper. Will paper be effective? What do you think? Will paper be as effective as bubble wrap or not? Let's get this beaker out. Come on, beaker. Out you come. Hmm, I think it's stuck on with that sticky tape pretty well. Come on. <laughs> gotcha. So, now if we just did some thick layers of paper just like one big thick layer. I don't think that would be all that effective, to be honest. So, might actually do like another layer of paper, but with a, a little bit of a gap. Okay, so actually, you know what would probably make a, you know what I'm thinking? You know what I'm thinking here? I'm actually going to do a zigzag fold, forward, back, 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 forward, back. Then I might fold that in half like that. You'll see what I'm doing in a moment, fold it again. So that when I open it up, it's sort of, it's got all these like little ridges in it. I'm going to go around like that. What I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to trap air trying to trap air because I know that insulation that air is a very good insulator if you can trap air so animals fur your mammals fur and birds feathers they insulate the bird and the animal by trapping air and if you can trap air then you can stop the movement of heat from one place to another so I need to make a, a base. Okay, so I'm making a base like that. That's good. And I'll just sticky tape that base on. And we have to make a little lid as well, don't we? It's a 
make sure it's a fair experiment. There we go. And a little bit of a lid, a little bit of a hat for it. Perfect. Fold, fold, fold. And the hat is ready to go on. Good, this is taking a little bit of time. So I'm going to cheat just a little bit and put a match there. And I'm going to dip that match in wax. And that will really get the heat going. So we have to use the same amount of water each time. We have to try and get it to the same initial temperature each time, which was boiling. And Okay, there we go. That like turbocharged it. Probably should have set a better example by number one, wearing my safety goggles. And number two, holding the match with some tweezers so that I don't burn myself. Okay, but yeah, sometimes you can you make mistakes and you can improve on them. Okay, that's that's pretty close to boiling. Very good. All right. Are we ready, my friends? Yes, we're ready. Okay, I'll put the stopwatch there. And pop this in. Pour in the hot water. Blow that out. Pop in the thermometer. Oh, no, 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 I'm going slow. In the thermometer, put the lid on. Okay, we'll have a maximum temperature just in a moment 81.5, 82.8. Come on, higher, higher, go higher, please. 83.2. Oh no, I only went to 83.2. What is going on? What did I do? Oh, that's a pain. You know why that's a pain? Because ideally we wanted to have the same starting temperature. Hmm. Paper, I should put paper and air. Anyway, I'm not going to go back. Hopefully, we'll see how we go. We'll, we'll just see how we go. Three, two, one and the first temperature is 81. Well, isn't that interesting? It's not okay, it's it's too early to draw any conclusions with one value, so let's just let's just wait a little bit, shall we? Okay, that was just it's too early. And in five, four Three, two, one. I'm going to have to put 78. Okay, 78. I think the next temperature will be interesting. Okay, I'm pretty sure the next temperature is going to be interesting. Do you know why? Because it will be the same as the control. Five, four, three, two, one, seventy-six. There we go. It's the same as the control, but we started at three point four degrees cooler. So that's the fascinating thing. Let's see what happens now, eh? Three, two, one. No, got that wrong. Wait up. Five, four, three, two, one, seventy-four. Aha! Uh -huh. So now it's warmer than the control. So paper, paper works better than nothing. <laughs> so if you're ever stuck out in the cold, grab out, grab out a ream of A4 paper and start wrapping it around you, my friends. Hey, I'm the paper man. So paper actually works as insulation. Now don't forget, it's not just the paper. It's actually the air that it's trapping as well. So 73. How will it work compared to bubble wrap? 
This will, let's find out. Okay. It's not a perfect experiment because they didn't start at the same temperature, but should be able to draw some interesting conclusions. Five, four, three, two, one, seventy one. It's losing about a degree at a time now. It's three degrees above the original um, control. Probably need to redo the paper at the same starting temperature as the bubble wrap, to be fair. And 67. Now, will it be 66 or 65? I'm going to bet on 65 will be our final value. Yeah, it will be 65. I can jump the gun there. And in 5, 4, 3, 2... No! 66! It is because I'm rounding up. Okay, so let me get a red pen. Let me get a red pen. Okay, so we started at 83, which is about here. It's the lowest of the, then 81. A little bit jumbled here. 78. Seventy six, that's the same temperature there. A little bit higher. Seventy three. Seventy one. Sixty nine. Sixty eight. Sixty seven. And sixty six. So we get a graph that looks like this and that's our paper so it looks like the bubble wrap was the most effective but it started at a higher temperature than the paper so what we can definitely conclude is both bubble wrap and paper do work as better insulation materials than if you had nothing okay so we'll put um, both Insulators were better, or both materials, both materials um, were better uh, insulators than no materials. Wow, what a big lesson. Um, lots of important skills there. Measuring, uh, designing an experiment, trying to keep it as fair as possible, only changing one variable, which was the um, type of insulation, drawing uh, a line graph, um, plotting the points, drawing a, a curve, uh, drawing some conclusions. Wow, <laughs> what a lesson. Okay, so if I was stuck out in the cold, I'd probably first wrap myself in bubble wrap, and if I couldn't find that, then I'll probably find um, some paper. Okay, well, looking forward to seeing the next lesson. Bye for now. Well, here we are. Our last 
lesson. Hopefully you've enjoyed this course. And we're looking at some irreversible changes, otherwise known as chemical reactions. And in this course, we've actually seen a few different types of chemical reactions. We've been burning lots of candles and lots and lots of matches. That's all chemical reactions because they're irreversible. Once you burn a match, you're not going to be able to relight that match, are you? Temperature changes. Oh yeah, we've, we've done a lot of temperature changes, haven't we? Heating things up. Haven't done so much cooling things down, like, oh, we did a, the insulation experiment, but not with ice or something like that. Gases produced. Do you remember the gas which was produced when you ate sherbet? Carbon dioxide gas. Yeah. We never did precipitate forming. Um, that's for maybe when you get a bit older. And some colour changes. Oh yes, remember the testing of the pH? Woohoo! Well, we're going to um, do a little demonstration now. This used to be one of my favourite demonstrations. It works okay with the small equipment, but it actually works a lot better with larger equipment. So. We'll just do it with the small one, and if you're able to, then you can actually scale it up. And what shall we call it? It's not like it's like the candle pump up, the candle pump up experiment or demonstration, I should say. And I used to do it with the little white plates, but I actually think it might be better to do it with the the lid of the containers. And you need a little birthday candle. So I've got a nice little pink birthday candle here. And the tallest, the 10 mil conical flask, because that's going to go like that over the candle. Now, at the moment, the candle's too tall. So I'm going to get a little pair of scissors and snip snip the bottom of that candle and it's probably still a little tiny bit too tall so one more little snip there we go now we need to glue we need to glue the candle to the plastic there now we're not going to use like normal glue we're just going to use a bit of wax because wax can um wax a it can be used as a temporary glue for a short period of time. It's not very strong. It's not a strong glue, but I think it will be strong enough. So I'm dripping some candle wax onto the plastic container. And then I'm going to heat up the bottom of that candle. I'll just blow that out. And then I'll try and hold that vertical until the wax solidifies. Now that, of course, is a reversible change you know solid liquid to a solid or a solid to a liquid and then liquid to a solid and let's see Yay! <laughs> see i told you it worked as a glue and we'll have a little bit of a practice run to do this fairly quickly okay good all right we need some water we need to put some water into the base of this container there we go and we definitely need to color it so that you can see the water so let's put some blue I might put a blue drop on one side and a yellow drop on the other side what do you have a couple of yellow drops on the other side I think that looks pretty good now and we're then going to light the candle now this will happen quite quickly this little demonstration we'll see what either, it'll either work or it won't work we'll find out and are we ready so there's the uh irreversible change a candle burning and we're about to do well something let's have a look are you ready Set. Whoa! That 
might work better than I thought. <gasps> that was great. That was awesome. Now you might think that the water was sucked up, but in actual fact, the water was pushed up by air pressure. When the candle burns, it actually produces water vapour, and then when that water vapour condenses, at least behind a vacuum, and air pressure is able to push the water up. That was really good. Sometimes, sometimes my little demonstrations surprise me. I love that. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> now, it's hard to do it again, difficult to do it again, because... Remember, remember how I talked to you about a candle being wet and that a wet candle doesn't light, doesn't work very well? That candle's going to be wet. So, uh, I was going to say it's going to be very difficult to... Mm, this match has got some <laughs> wax on it. <laughs> I have to blow it. Oh! You're kidding me. Why did that go out? Yeah, I see. See, see, see. I, I told you a wet candle is hard to light. See? Oh. Yeah, see? No, I knew I couldn't do it again. Had my hopes up. Okay, I'm going to put this over to the side. And a favourite little, it's not a toy of mine, but ever been to a party or a celebration and they pull out my party poppers oh I love party poppers you pull this string and then you <laughs> <laughs> see why I love party poppers I might shoot one straight up in the air what do you think how high do you think it will go I'll lean back in the chair bring it here and ready set <laughs> That almost landed in the candle and would have gone on fire. I've got smoke in the room. I love these. And we're going to dissect one. No! No, don't dissect me! It's okay, it's for science. <laughs> so, um, got the worksheet. Oh, Jacob, don't spoil it with a worksheet. Yes, I'm going to spoil it with a worksheet. So, we need another party popper. And... I've got some like nail scissors. They're very, very good nail scissors. And well, it's got a label on it. The label's just a piece of paper. It goes around the outside. It's probably not even glued on. Nah, there we go. So we've got a label. Caution. That's about the only words I could possibly read on it. It's got some warning just in case you blow your eyeball out. They can say, look what it said. Don't aim it towards anybody. Nobody can read that. And then, so we've got a plastic body. Okay, so that's fairly important to realise. Plastic body, it's flexible and it's like a container. And that's quite important. So on this um, diagram here, I think it's fairly important to say that we've actually got like a plastic container. A plastic container. It's got strength. Plastic does have a bit of strength to it. Okay, that has got a piece of cardboard here. Now, where did my scissors go? Here they are. And if I put my um, scissors in and sort of lever, lever, out. Try not to hurt yourself with the scissors, of course. There we go. Now I can grab. There we go. It's got a piece of cardboard. That's important. There's some cardboard in the base. And on one side, it's got all these warnings that there's no... It says use only... Use only... I can't even... Use only, and then it's got all sorts of stuff. But, okay, so it's got a... It's got a cardboard um, base... And that's to actually, cardboard base, or end, that's actually to keep all the guts in. Woo! So, out come the guts. And what are the guts? 
the guts are the colorful ribbon, which are really super cool. I love them. One reason I love them is because if you get, um, and you can do this in your own time, if you get some water and like put, you know, one of the colored ribbons in like this, you could actually boil him up, all right? You could boil him up and get the get the color out, okay? And turn your water red. Very, very interesting. So they take up about oh, half, half of the body. So, and then I can see another cardboard disc. So let's put all the paper ribbon here, and that will unroll paper ribbon. And that's to help the party, so to speak. Then, I'm going to actually get my tweezers to extract the next layer, which is another cardboard disc. Okay, so another cardboard disc right there. And then it starts getting super interesting because I see this little white tube down there that I'm going to grab with the tweezers and pull it out. There we go. And that is very exciting because that's the explosive thing. So this is the explosive charge. So there's a piece of string that goes into the explosive charge. And so we've got a string and the explosive charge actually contains like gunpowder. I'm not joking. Explosive charge. That's why we couldn't actually send, the Tiny Science Lab couldn't send these out. I'd like to have sent out these, um, but we couldn't actually send them via um, plane transport because they don't like explosive charges on them. So, now how does it actually work? Well. If I was to hold this now, don't hold this and pull the string because you might blow your fingers off. Well, that's a little bit extreme, but you know, you could actually hurt yourself. When you pull the string out, what's actually sort of there is there's sort of like a match inside it, right? A match inside it and wrapped around it is a strike plate like this. So that when you pull the match, it lights the match, and then that heat ignites the gunpowder. So that's how that actually works. But there's another way to introduce the heat. You could use a candle to introduce the heat. Now, make sure you, if you do this, that you've got goggles on, goggles on. And I don't really like doing this, but I'll do it anyway. I'm going to extend my arm I'm going to hold this above the candle. Now warn everybody around, noise, about to have some noise. Well, I'm here all by myself, but <laughs> you know what I mean. You might have some people around. And then I light it. It's burning. Okay, it's burning. <coughs> oh, oh. That's not nice. Now, I felt a bit of spray on my hand. Um, so these are not designed these are not to design to do this. So if you do do it, it's at your own risk. You need to have safety goggles on, okay? Extend your hand, extend your hand. It's best if you have actually sort of like a, uh, like a gardening glove, if you put a gardening glove on. I might actually, I'm gonna do one more. And this is going to be my gardening glove. Um, Cause kaboom. Oh, I'm going to get another one. Oh. This is to celebrate the last lesson of the junior chemistry course. So here's my glove. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to make do a little bit, okay? There we go. Look at that. Now I'm safe. It's, it's the cloth I use to wipe everything up. It's probably covered in chemicals. It's probably worse. Okay, and we've got fire, and extended my arm, whoa, whoa, it's really, it really produces a big explosion. 
produces a lot of gas. And you know what that gas does? That gas expands. And that's what drives the, the cardboard plate or disc. And that cardboard disc pushes out the coloured ribbon. Yay! Well, that's it for this course. Yay! It's all over. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully you've learnt a lot. And um, I'm sure I'll see you in some other courses. We've got high school courses, chemistry courses, high school physics courses, high school electricity courses. Oh no, so much science. <laughs> anyway, it's been great doing science with you and I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Say hello and um, stay safe and bye for now. Bye-bye.